No, I I grew up in a city where there were were no metal at all. So uh, mm. the 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 cool kids in the schoolyard listened to punk rock, you know. And uh, I can hear by your accent that you're English. And I listen so, mostly South African, to... actually. South African. Yeah. So I, I I moved here from South Africa in 2002. So I live in the UK, but I I yeah. I, I lived in South Africa until I was about 21. Wow, that's interesting. Greetings, everybody, and welcome to episode 167 of Into the Necrosphere. This week, after two years of hard slog, I'm finally speaking to one of the most requested guests on this podcast. That man, of course, Thomas Erickson of Mork. We spoke about the band. We spoke about their upcoming record, Deep Year, due out for release on March 24th through Peaceful Records. Uh, we also spoke about Thomas's journey from being an 11-year-old punk rock and whippersnapper to the black metal legend that he is today. Uh, we spoke about his love for ACDC and much more. The anticipation, the wait was definitely worth it, as you're going to be finding out in a few minutes. But when it's done, don't go anywhere, because continuing with the Norwegian theme this week, I'm going to be reviewing the new record by Enslaved, that album, of course, Heimdall. Uh, I've been a little skeptical about this one, um, in part because... Uh, I wasn't entirely convinced by all of the singles that they were dropping in the uh, run-up to this release. But uh, what did I think of the album in its entirety? You are going to find out uh, straight after my conversation with Thomas. Uh, and then when that's done, don't go anywhere because there's a new Metallica single doing the rounds. And as much as you'll be able to find a wealth of sycophants praising them on YouTube React videos uh, and on singles reviews and all sorts of other nonsense, uh, there's only one impression that really matters, and I will share that on uh, this week's fiery installment of my weekly news rant. Um, if you are new to the podcast, make sure that you elbow drop the subscribe button on your platform of choice. Uh, follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, and uh, check out the Into the Necrosphere Teespring store for some Into the Necrosphere t-shirts, hoodies, etc. In about two weeks' time, I'm going to be dropping a design so masculine and so badass that experts confirm that if you wear it, anybody within a 10-meter radius of you will be in fear of their lives. Make sure that you follow my fellow horsemen of the podcast Apocalypse. Every Monday, Brandon Legion brings you Horrible 666. I'm on deck every Tuesday with Into the Necrosphere. Sensei Mike Hill uh, delivers the goods with Everything Went Black on a Wednesday. He's back every Thursday with my favorite podcast of the week, Necromaniacs, alongside his co-hosts Mike Scandado and Jeff Kashid. Uh, and then every Sunday, the Reverend Carl Haikara brings you the Horned Lord's message with his podcast, Soul Knox. And then final reminder... If uh, you live in the UK and uh, you have uh, time to spare on July the 29th and July the 30th, make sure you head over to the Hairy Dog in Derby uh, for Reaperfest, which will feature performances by firm Into the Necrosphere favourites, Ulthar, uh, as well as um, friends of Into the Necrosphere, Heathen Deity, and the Ruins of Everest, amongst many others. Uh, I will be there, and I hope to see as many of you as possible to uh, shoot the breeze, have a few beers, and uh, watch some great music. And on that note, my friends, I would like to welcome to the podcast for the first time, definitely not the last time, Thomas Erickson of Mork. First of all, as I said to you, this has been two and a half years in the making, so cheers. Um, cheers. First and foremost. Secondly, how have you been? I've been good. Been pretty good. I just went through a ugly ugly flu actually just a few weeks ago and i'm glad to be be able to shake that off you know uh so now i'm just ready for uh, new releases uh, this released, was, um, i was... released a new single just the other weekend and yeah. there's uh, a couple more coming i suppose so this was this was flu not the not the covid though not the COVID. I, I, I should say, uh, I, did, I never took a COVID test, but uh, I suppose it's just a normal flu, you know? Yeah. Uh, did you did you have COVID at any point during the, um, you know, during the whole pandemic palaver? I actually caught COVID um, from my stepson, uh, uh, and that yeah. was uh, at the very late stages of the pandemic. So I finally caught it, you know? 
<laughs> finally, finally broke through the walls. But um, I never got sick, you know. It wasn't a big deal. It was like nothing. I just shook it yeah. off uh, after a few days. Yeah, yeah. Um, now you, you and I kind of, or actually, I should say, right before the pandemic, about a year before the pandemic, I started this podcast, and I'd say maybe about three months in. I had a whole bunch of people hitting me up saying, you need to check out the Thomas Erickson podcast. It's awesome. Um, so I, I naturally went and went and checked it out. And I have to tip my hat to you. Um, there's there's a positive and a negative to this. So your interview with Gall was absolutely exceptional. Uh, but I am sorry that I listened to it before I spoke to him because I, as I was talking to him, I kept on in the back of my mind kind of thinking, I don't want to ask him this question because the 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 interview that uh, Thomas did with him was so comprehensive. I don't want to repeat anything that's been in there, but it's like that that really, my friend, was absolutely sterling work. I have to say, and especially so because having spoken to him now, um, you know he's a he's a great guy, but he's a he's a tricky character to interview. Like I think if you wanted to, you know, like gamify it and assess somebody's skills as an interviewer and as a podcaster. You you know, Gaal is the final boss. <laughs> so. uh, I don't know. Uh, thank you very much, by the way. Thank you. Uh, the thing is that uh, that wasn't that interview. You know, it was mm. uh, two people sitting down and having drinks and having a good time. And uh, not I, I never have questions prepared or anything. It's just yeah. pu push record and whatever happens, happens, you know. And uh, the, the, the podcast thing was something I just dove into. Uh, when the pandemic hit, you know, so I wasn't, I, I'd never been into media like that. It was just for fun, you know, and it just, it just grew. And somehow I, I'm not going to say that I'm a good podcaster or ask the right questions or anything like that. But for some reason, it seems like the guests uh, relaxed, you know, and then you get the most oddest replies in conversation. You've also been on both ends of the spectrum. So you know what it's like to be a, uh, an artist, a musician being interviewed. Um, and I guess you also understand the the frustration from the musician's perspective of being asked the same questions, you know, it feeling very scripted. You know, the person kind of sitting there with a piece of paper and it feels like they're ticking down a down a checklist of what they need to cover off so that they can get yeah. the sound bites that they need. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I mean, that was, you know, I, I was going to ask you in a second why, you know, what made you decide to start a podcast. But for me, that was one of the biggest things. I, I, I was writing for a couple of websites. I kept on, you know, having these great conversations with with people that went, you know, completely off script because, you know, when you're young and you you're first doing it, you you do have your your questions. Thinking, I wish there were a way for me to let people hear this. And then also sitting in press days, and you know, you wait your you wait your turn for your half an hour or your hour or whatever. And you overhear the questions that the bands are being asked. And I was just like, as a fan, I've no interest in hearing this, these kind of canned responses. I can imagine for a musician, it must be fucking excruciating. Um, and and again, like the, the interesting thing is when you start talking to somebody and you get you know, just get to know them as a person, and you just you know, you, you treat it like you're sitting here having, you know, you and I having dinner, you and I just, you know, cracking open a few beers and uh, you know, as I said to you before, talking shit. Um, that's where the really interesting stuff comes from. That's the stuff that makes me, you know, buy into the artist more and, you know, uh, almost experience oh, the music you, in a man. different way. Uh, have you got me back now? Yeah. Yes. You're back. Oh, no, no, I don't know. I don't know what happened there. But I think you've got the gist of what I was, what, what, yeah. what I was saying, right? The th you know what? Uh, I, I, what got me to dive into the podcasting thing was actually the Joe Rogan experience. Uh, mm. I'm a big fan of what he does, you know, and uh, it was in particular his episodes with musicians, like, you know, the one uh, where he had James Hetfield over. And I never heard an interview with James Hetfield like that before, if you know what mm -hmm. I mean. It wasn't that interview and it was way more interesting. And uh, I just it was kind of a comfortable setting. And I just I don't know. I just enjoy the aura of it, you know. Mm. I, I agree with you on on the Joe Rogan experience, and actually, as, as soon as you mentioned it, I was like, "Yeah, the the James Hetfield one, uh, the Josh Homme one that he did was really good as well." Um, but James yeah. Hetfield again, tricky tricky character to interview. I, 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 you know, to the point that you've just made, I don't think I've actually ever heard um, 
I've, I don't think I've ever heard a, a particularly in-depth interview with him. He's he's quite guarded. He's he's quite sort of um, you know not on stage so much. But I think he's he's a bit of an introvert in real life, which you know again probably is is there's there's definitely parallels to the folks that you and I would be speaking to in um, you know the the sort of extreme death black metal scene. Absolutely. But you like when when you talk to people. It does sound a bit like, you know, you, you can tell there's a, you know, you, you sound like you guys are old bros when you're talking. And it's not just, you know, um, your conversation with Golds, with, you know, a lot of the folks that you've spoken to. Uh, I guess, how have you kind of gotten so immersed in the in, 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 in the scene, particularly in Norway? I mean, I know you, you, you live in Norway, but I assume you're around about the same age that I am? That depends on your age. I'm 42 years old. You you what? I'm forty two. Forty two. I'm um, I'm turning thirty nine this summer. Yeah. So yeah. so how how is a how is a young blood like you managed to uh, work, you know get get yourself uh, uh, accepted so much by the uh, by the old guard? Uh, that uh, has to be the music. I've been doing my black metal thing now for twenty years, and uh, for the last ten years, I've been present and releasing official music with Mork. And uh, as you said, it's a small country, you know, and uh, you after a while you just get to know people. So um, most of the people that has been guests on the podcast was actually uh, people I knew from before, you know. Hmm. But uh, it was interesting to have those conversations because I didn't know everything about them, you know. And I, for some reason, I, I got them to just you know, just uh, squeeze the cloth out uh, every single drop of their histories. And that was interesting, you know. So, uh, you know, ironic that you should say that, because I was going to also ask, you know, what got you down this 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 road? I mean, is it like, uh, did, you know, you would have, you know, and you would have been mid-teens when, you know, the, the second wave in, in Norway started really kicking off. Um, you know, what, what piqued your interest in, let, let, let's actually talk about music first and foremost, like, you know, when you were younger, what what sort of music were you getting into? What were you discovering by yourself that wasn't necessarily stuff that you were just hearing around the house that your parents were playing? No, I, I grew up in a city where there were, were no metal at all. So uh, mm. the, the, the cool kids in the schoolyard listened to punk rock, you know, and uh, I can hear by your accent that you're English. And I listened to... South, South African, to... actually. South African? Yeah. So I, I I moved here from South Africa in 2002. So I live in the UK, but I I, yeah. I I lived in South Africa until I was about 21. Wow, that's interesting, yeah. actually. <laughs> yeah. Now we can, so, we, can uh, we can talk about that in, in in detail, but the the uh, yeah, I'll, I'll 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 pause there. We'll get we'll get to my my South African heritage in a second. But you were saying yeah, about cool. punk rock. Yeah, yeah, I got into the old 70s punk rock from uh, the UK, you know, like uh, Sex Pistols, UK Subs, The Buscocks, uh, and uh, Undertones, Sham 69, uh, you know, all of those classics, uh, but uh, mostly the Sex Pistols was my thing, you know, and that is also what got me to pick up the guitar in the first place. Uh, and like I told you, there were no metal in this city, so... When after I was about eleven to thirteen, when I discovered the punk stuff, and as we grew older, the kids in school and my uh, my friends and stuff, they got into more and more. You know, Nirvana came around. Uh, you know, Rancid, No Effects, uh, like uh, more modern kinds of punk. Mm -hmm. And I I always been swimming along with my friends, you know, what they've been listening to. And uh, after a while, I discovered ACDC, which was, it that went straight home into my heart, you know. that's That was, became my favorite all-time band, ACDC. It's been really important to me. And uh, along with that, I started discovering more heavy stuff. Black Sabbath, Iron Maiden, you know, Metallica, the usual suspects. But uh, that is when I kind of found my soul within the metal genre you know and mm. that was way before i even knew what extreme metal was yeah yeah so uh, your your exposure to sex pistols where did that come from like did you hear it on television and sort of went out and investigated for yourself or, or, or where was the where was the interest peaked 
that was actually from the cool kids in the schoolyard who were smoking, you know, outside the schoolyard and doing mischief. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as it is. And uh, I remember we, we, we weren't able to get uh, punk clothing, so we made our own, I suppose, like they did back in the day. I remember yeah. we had this thing where we used a blank T-shirt and we would just use a Sharpie and write a lot of swear words and punk <laughs> bands and shit. You know, and I got and I saw some pictures of Johnny Rotten and Sid Vicious in old, uh, you know, like rock history books and stuff. Mm. Saw some documentaries. I was totally had I had stars in my eyes, you know. And uh, I started the, the the safety pin thing with some chains here and there. I even had at the worst, I was about thirteen, I suppose. I had cowboy boots, leather pants. And uh, basically the same shirts Johnny Rotten would wear, you know. Mm. <laughs> All in. On that, on that, never mind the bollocks. Uh, oh, never mind the bollocks record. What was your, what was your, what was the tracks that that really kind of spoke to you at that time? Uh, All of them. Yeah, Sex Pistols doesn't have a big catalog, and uh, no. I, I, I still to this day can enjoy enjoy Sex Pistols. Uh, it's perfectly good rock and roll with an attitude, and it's original because the guys or Steve Jones in particular, he learned to play as they went along, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. they have their total own sound. But what about if I should take out some highlights from their uh, song catalog? It has to be Anarchy in the UK, obviously. Um, I'm a big fan of Did You Know Wrong, which I suppose only was a B-side or something. It wasn't mm. on Never Mind the Bollocks. Um Silly thing, the the song they did for the rock and roll swindle. Yeah, I, there's plenty of good stuff, man. Yeah, yeah. No, I my my journey was a little back to front, actually. If 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 I compare it to yours, so my my first band I can recall discovering by myself was uh, Depeche Mode. I was five. Oh. I know. I remember exactly where I was. I was five years old. I heard them perform "Shake the Disease" on top of the pops, a recording that we got in South Africa. And I, I remember being so unbelievably fascinated by the song. Everyone in the room hated it. My parents, you know, I was with my parents and my cousin. They all hated it. They thought it was terrible. I, I loved it so much. I would sing it to myself over and over again so that I wouldn't forget what it sounded like. And then I discovered Aha, um, yeah. you know, and really, really liked um, the Hunting High and Low record. Um, particularly, there was a, a song on there called um, I've Been Losing You which I just, I mean, I became completely like obsessed with the song and it kind of gradually started moving from there. And then my, my big, uh, you know, the big sort of awakening for me, I was always attracted to stuff that was a little darker and a little edgier. But when I heard Thunderstruck for the first time, it was like 50 light bulbs just went, you know, and it was like, I, I, I heard something that sounded like it was, literally part of like the my my my, my dna and i and i remember like again you know yeah sort of repeating the song over and over and over to myself my head and when i finally got the razor's edge i think my mom spent a good year listening to that record every single day constantly on repeat i mean it was just like that that was the album as far as i was concerned then i got uh, fly on the wall which yeah. I know, you know, amongst ACDC fans is not the most beloved record, but for me, I, I will always have a soft spot for that. But um, what it. was your what was your first ACDC experience? My first ACDC experience was in the basement at uh, my old childhood friend's house, and he later actually became the first bass player in Mork, but that's a different story. Uh, his older brother had the vinyl records because he, he was a bit older than us, obviously. And we didn't grow up with vinyl. We had cassette tapes and CDs, you know. But he had a vinyl collection. And I suppose the first thing I heard with ACDC, it had to be uh, If You Want Blood, the live album, and uh, I think uh, Back in Black, which is a pretty good start, I would say. Uh but you know what? You you mentioned Fly on the Wall and stuff. Uh, I love that record, man. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I actually sat around here in my studio here. And uh, every once in a while, I pick up my Gibson SG and I just riff on ACDC stuff. And I actually went through Fly on the Wall each fucking track and learned all the riffs. 
you know and uh, yeah. because i never knew that as a kid i did never figure out the chords because it's not as simple as people believe it is actually there there is some special chords in there mm -hmm. but uh i loved love that album i love flick of the switch for those about rock is probably my current favorite acdc album okay that's an interesting uh, choice. I, uh, yeah i oh it, for those about rock there's a dark menacing and heavy sound to that album just mm. listen to it loud when you have the time and notice that the riffs are a bit darker the lyrical themes are dark i, I just love it man and the fucking golden jacket with the cannon yeah I, oh, yeah. I I definitely think that's one thing that has always stood out to me about ACDC. There is there is a a dark edge to a lot of their songs. Um, you know, even if it's you know it, even if it's not immediately perceptible, it I, I it it kind of comes out in the way Angus will let a chord ring, for example, or you know it'll it'll just be it'll be something in the way that Bon Scott delivers a line, or you know Brian Johnson even delivers a line. Fly on the Wall to me is a great example. I think the title track. It's fucking badass. It's like, you know, there's like a real sort of a, a meanness and an aggression to the song. And I know a lot of folks hate the production of the record. I, I Alan Avril did a ACDC breakdown on his podcast, and, you know, he was talking about the albums, and he also said it's not that bad. He just doesn't like the production. I love the production. It's, it's I, I think the like the echo that's on the guitar and the vocals, it just sounds, it sounds so quintessentially 80s, but there's yes, just something it about it that works so fucking well. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like a cult record, a hidden gem. You know what I mean? Yeah. It sounds like a it sounds like a B movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then you know, if you want blood, what a what a song. I mean, again, that that example of what I was saying now about like the core just ringing out. You know, in that um, in that chorus, like if you want blood, da da, and he's just kind of leaving it. It's like you know, letting the letting the 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 fires of hell rise up while it's uh, while it's ringing fantastic. in the background. Fantastic. Yeah, no. Absolutely. So from ACDC, what was the progression from there? Because this is like, I, I, I assume now the ball is rolling and things start to, to compound from there. Yeah, uh, in the same uh, vinyl collection that uh, my friend had uh, inherited from his brother, there was obviously the other ones that I got into. And that was, uh, for some reason, it's a, bit, it's a strange one to be the first metal thing you hear. But my first metal album was actually a Lost Rocket, uh, Rocket album from 1989, called Annihilation Principle. I don't know if you know about Lost Rocket, but I know uh, Lost Rocket. I must be very honest with you. I don't think I've actually ever listened to a Lost Rocket record. No, uh, no not all of it is good, but that album in particular, uh, Annihilation Principle, you need to check that out. It's harsh mm. and like, pretty heavy and cool, man. So that I remember I copied that over to a tape and had that in a Walkman and shit. And I also heard uh, Onslaught was one of my early ones. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that was actually the album they did with Steve Grimmett, the In Search of Sanity. I think that's from 89 too, actually. Uh, and then obviously he had Iron Maiden records. He had Peace of Mind is one that stands out early on for me. So the next thing after I shook off the Last Rocket thing for them, I love it now, trust me. But I went on to Iron Maiden, and that became my next love, you know, Iron Maiden and Black Sabbath. Uh, I, I, Iron Maiden for me was always a band. I mean, I, my friends were always totally and utterly <laughs> obsessed with it. I was quite selective in what I liked when it when it came to Iron Maiden, but I, I will definitely say Peace of Mind and and the song Revelations in particular. Was always was always something that I really loved. I think I always liked the 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 Iron Maiden live albums probably more than I liked the studio records. Like, um, you know, particularly Live After Death, it had this sort of all of those songs had this kind of energy to it on that record that was just it, it was kind of worlds away for me from what I heard, you know, on the on the studio recordings. And it's where those songs like really came alive. You know, whether it was Number of the Beast, whether it was Revelations, there was just like a different energy to them. It's a it's a funny thing you you pull out revelations because that is my least favorite maiden song. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, I think it's kind of boring. <laughs> no, but uh, but when talking about that album, I suppose my favorites would be "Die with Your Boots On." Uh, Still life has always been a big favorite, and then you have the more obscure ones like "Sun and Steel," and uh, 
I get a uh, quest for fire. Isn't that one too? I think. Yeah, a quest for fire is on there. I think so. Uh, but you know what? I love the Maiden the studio albums. Uh, I mm. I ate them whole. Trust me. Uh, every single album, actually. I I have a bit of a hard time with the Blaze Bailey ones, though. Uh, there's something. I'm not going to talk shit about Blaze Bailey. He's actually a really nice guy. But the, the, there's something about his voice that doesn't really hit home with me. And I think the production on, on those two albums is a bit thin. So I never got into those. But uh, everything else from the 80s and up to, I would say, uh, the Brave New World album, that was a big one for me, actually. Mm. Yeah, I, I've, uh, again, I've, I've sort of been hot and cold on it. There's, there's quite a lot of Iron Maiden stuff I don't like. I, I, did, I was very pleasantly surprised by Sinjutsu. I thought that was a... Um, I thought that was a, 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 a an album I expected absolutely nothing from, and yeah. I thought this is actually pretty decent. To me, the later Iron Maiden stuff after Brave New World, I don't know. It's too much. I don't know if it's Steve Harris or what it is, but it's mm -hmm. too long intros, too long and boring songs without any hooks. You know, there's no more hooks. Yeah, where are the hooks, man? That you used to have back in the day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and Bla Blaze Bailey, I, I, I think they could have stuck just about anybody in that spot, and they could have put Rob Halford in that spot, and he would have gotten a hard time. It, it, yeah. It's, it, which, which is kind of like if we talk about Black Sabbath, that's mm. that's it's a testament to how good Ronnie James Dio was that he he's actually one of the few singers that was able to step into the role of a vocalist in an extremely iconic band. And an iconic seat, and be Brian Johnson by people. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, you're right. You're right. You're right. Now, I will say very controversially. So this is like cards. You know, we, we're exchanging cards. We're putting cards on the table. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Be, 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 people are going to be shocked. Not not unless anyone who listens to the podcast. You will possibly be shocked. Ronnie James Dio to me is the is the superior Sabbath vocalist. Oh, dude, I uh, I, I do agree, but. Again, uh, Black Sabbath with the different vocalists are completely different bands. Yes, you can't that is true. You, you can't compare Aussie period to the Dio period. But yeah. no, uh, I am also a big, big, big fan of um, the later albums. Actually, you know, with um, Tony Martin that era, I'm a big yeah. fan of those albums. Man, Tear and Headless Cross, Forbidden. I love that stuff. Yeah. And uh, also, uh, I love the song uh, or the album uh, "Born Again" with uh, Ian Gillan. Yeah, ob obviously, and uh, with the Stonehenge and everything. Um, and I even do like uh, Seven Star," what was supposed to be Iomi's solo album, when he has uh, who is it? Glenn Hughes singing. Yeah, fucking excellent album. Dehumanizer for me is the is the record. That was that was also a record that ver, uh, that had a very big influence on me because when I was getting into, so I went from ACDC to getting into bands like, um, so first it was Guns and Roses and Metallica, and then it sort of was then then I started studying up on my history. So it was like Judas Priest. Um, I was a big fan of Wasp. I, I yeah. still am. Um, and I Love got it. the old Black Sabbath records, but I remember a guy giving me a copy of Dehumanizer, and I just thought that some of the some of the tracks on there to this day to me just give me goosebumps like you listen to that there's a ballad on there called too late and it's just for me like prime prime ronnie james dio i mean like like if, if any if anyone ever questioned how great of a vocalist he is they just need to hear that song and that to me settles the argument immediately but i need to ask you uh did you ever catch um the devil you know album no not really um did you hear did it I did. I did hear it briefly. I, in my old age, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm starting to, uh, I'm starting to lose it. I think. Mm. Hold on for ten seconds. Um, it was released in two thousand and nine. It was. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, it was. The heaven, it was. It was. Um, it was called Heaven and Hell. Hell. Yeah, 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 yeah. I thought. I thought it was that. Yeah, I, I, I know that record, and that was very good. I really, really like that. It seems like that just came out in a void. Uh, I didn't really hear about it or anything. It was a bit strange thing. Maybe I just didn't pay attention at the time. But uh, that's also a little hidden gem. I haven't listened too much to it. I'm not sure. Is it on Spotify? I'm not sure that it is, actually. Um, 
I I I'll need to I'll need to double check. I mean, I if I listened to it and I, I know I, I know I've heard the record a couple of times, it would have been on Spotify. Because yeah, I think the time it, that it came know, out, it was um, you know I was listening to everything on Spotify. So yeah, we are but, lazy, you know. Yeah, Spotify <laughs> doesn't pay shit either, so uh, it's a double edged sword. <laughs> yeah. But that there there was talk of them doing more records as Heaven and Hell. Um, and for some reason, yeah. and unfortunately, I think you know any any plans they may have had to do that got shelved when Ronnie James Dio passed away. But uh, it, it was a, it was a fantastic um, what's that? It was a fantastic record that and and that combination for me, you know, Dio fronting Sabbath was top notch. Yeah, and you need the Vinny Apice on drums or Vinny Apice or whatever he calls himself. Uh... I think it's Apice. It is because the two brothers use two different ways of <laughs> saying their name just to separate themselves. Yeah, yeah. I was um, actually just a funny, quick little story. I was actually when we played in uh, in uh, California uh, in 2019. I went and saw a, sh a gig at the Whiskey A Go Go on the Sunset Strip, uh, and that was uh, Dave Evans, the very first ACDC vocalist, actually. Oh wow. Yeah, he had put together a band on the spot that did co ACDC covers. That was a cool little thing. But the thing was, just beside me, there was almost nobody there. But just two two feet to my left or whatever, there was there was Carmine a piece. <laughs> oh shit! Yeah, and I never I never touched him or anything. I just hmm, there's Carmine a piece, man. Yeah. <laughs> and there's Dave Evans. <laughs> so here's the question, though. Brian Johnson or Bon Scott? A lot of people is going to hate me now, but I will probably go towards Brian, his early albums first. But mm. it's it's kind of like Aussie Dio. It's two different things, two different yeah. attitudes. So I love everything ACDC, man, just to yeah. be a politician. <laughs> I, I I will say I think right now, like you mentioned, uh, uh, for those about to rock, my favorite ACDC song is mm. a song called "Squealer" off uh, "Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap." I think it's Angus's greatest moment as a you know playing a solo. It's just like there's like an unhinged quality to that solo where because it's a it's it's a bit longer than his average solo would be, and I mean he's a great guitarist anyway. But yeah. there's like a it's just like he's just wailing away for like you know several minutes and he just sounds so fucking cool everything about that song there's like a swagger to the song bon scott has a swagger to his voice it's sleazy it's filthy it's just fucking genius everything is awesome about bon scott era acdc wrapped up in one song and uh, you know what acdc in the 70s were just magical and perfect anyway any way yeah. you turn it they 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 are all good songs you know and uh, yeah, great know. Pl great players so your first uh, exposure to the extreme side of stuff, like like, were you black metal first or death metal first? I would have to say death metal first, but I, I was never a death metal fan. It was just I discovered, for some reason uh, or another, I, I discovered Cannibal Corpse lyrics on the internet <laughs> really early on. And I remember... Yeah. Seeing the fucking logo and the splatter covers and reading the lyrics without hearing any music for a long while. So I just read these fucking, um, you know, uh, hospital journals that they use for uh, lyrics, you know. And uh, I don't know, that made an impression. It was quite brutal and graphic. And uh, after a while, I did hear the music too, you know. And uh, Cannibal Corpse is uh, probably it's my favorite death metal band. It's maybe a cliche, but I love that band. Yeah, my I would say like de death metal for me, the discovery was definitely um, the incomplete by obituary. When I heard that the first time, I remember hearing "I'm in Pain" and I was like, "Jesus, this is so fucking heavy." Um, Gothic by Paradise Lost was a very, very big record for me. I, I again, I, I remember very distinctly hearing it for the first time, hearing the female vocal come in, and I, I'd never heard anything like that before. Uh, the Fourth Crusade by Bolt Thrower, but when it came to to black metal, it was it sort of came in stages. You know, my first, my earliest exposure to black metal was through Cradle of Filth on the Death Is Just oh. Beginning three compilation that Nuclear Blast did, 
and I liked it, but it was when I started discovering the Norwegian stuff that I was like, okay, this is like on a, there was, again, it was, you know, like uh, the experience that I had with ACDC during in the nighttime eclipse and during uh philosophy were the two records that, that were exactly the same impact for me that that thunderstruck out on me. You know, it's like a, it's like a real sea change in, your, you know, what's like changes your 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 appetite, what's your appetite for something completely different, changes the way that you that you listen to and that you look at music. What was your what 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 were what were those records or what were the what was kind of the the paradigm shift for you when it came to black metal? Ha. Huh. I believe it was when I uh, went to the Roskilde Festival in Denmark uh, back in 2001. Uh and I remember I went through the itinerary and uh, looking for metal bands, obviously. And the uh, Roskilde is a mixed bag, you know. There's plenty of different genres going on there. But I saw that Mayhem were playing. And I just, uh, Mayhem is probably a metal band, you know. I didn't know it was black metal. I just thought it was metal, you know. Hmm. So I went to see them. And uh, that, you know, you know what Mayhem is. And the Mayhem in... 2001 that was barbed wires knives in the in the arm it was pig heads you know it was blast beads uh screaming and everything and uh that made an impression i was like i'm not sure what this is i don't even know what to what to think <laughs> so uh i went home from there and i started digging around in what black metal was all about and uh then i obviously found the controversial stuff you know the church burnings and murders and whatnot and uh you know obligatory bursum and mayhem are the two names uh, mentioned so i started checking out bursum and um that awoken something within me you know the, i was sold something just grabbed me and pulled me in and uh i don't know i've been kind of lost in that since then you know uh, it was something about the eerie sounds, the depressive lonesome sounds of those particular bursum clips I did hear back then. Mm -hmm. I've always been fascinated by like the, the European um, festival culture. You know, like you 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 use Roskilde as an example, and there's festivals in Spain where I've seen this. You know, you've got like Alanis Morissette, and then you've got Napalm Death. You know, yep. it's it's. I, that Roskilde crowd back in two thousand and one. How did they? How did they react to Mayhem? Were they into it? Were they? Because I mean, you're you're absolutely right about the obviously the imagery of it. I mean, it was it was mm. truly abrasive. I mean, it would be abrasive in twenty twenty three, but mm. for that time in particular, I mean, it was like it was genuinely shocking. Yeah, I, I think they were beyond the shock factor already. Then I think you know, two thousand and one, they have already released. A couple of albums with uh, Blasphemer starting to become a bit more, uh, it's wrong to say commercial, but it, a bit more accepted, I suppose. And uh, Pal palatable, yeah. And uh, I, I was uh, there with my father, and uh, a relative of ours was working for the Roskilde Festival, so we had this backstage uh, treatment. So I was standing on the side of the stage and watching, and uh, there, there was a, this was the yellow stage which is like the smallest tent i think and it was packed you know there was plenty of people there so uh there's always some uh people who are interested in in what's happening you know and it seems seemed like people were liking it but this is a long time ago so i don't remember that much you know um so the so so discovering mayhem, discovering Burzum, This obviously you mentioned two thousand and one. So this was you know past all the controversy and you know all of the stuff that happened with Varg. Do you have any recollections of of? Or did you have an awareness of that shit while it was happening? Because I would assume in Norway that it it would have been spoken of at least in the press quite a lot. Um, I mean, I certainly remember being in South Africa, seeing I saw the very infamous Kerrang uh, cover, and yeah. you know some of the the, the local magazines and stuff. I remember there was one article in particular in this kind of like housewives magazine where they had gangster rap and they had black metal and it was like the two worst music genres ever. And then they've got this, you know, they, they, they had a, a picture of the, the home invasion uh, ice tea album cover. And then they had a picture of uh, Vox standing there with a knife 
and they had a um they i think they had in the night side eclipse and i do remember thinking this must be the most horrific stuff you can imagine and so three years later or probably two three years later when i heard it it was like jesus this is incredible <laughs> but mm -hmm. were, were you did you have were you conscious of what was going on at the time did you pay any attention to it when it, while it was happening uh, to be honest, I don't remember any talks of it. And uh, you need to keep in mind, I'm a, I'm a couple of years younger than you. And yeah. uh, I, I, have, I was about six or seven when that stuff went down. So I never paid attention to the news back then. Uh, so no, it was uh, not in my world. But I read all about it some years later, though, obviously. And uh, yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've seen con uh, the controversies um, since then. With Vari escaping from prison and stealing a car at gunpoint and stuff, I remember that quite well. That was in two thousand and three, I think. <laughs> yeah, now he's out living in the woods as a uh, survivalist. <laughs> so... uh, he lives in France with his whole family and have uh, homeschooling and everything. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a he's an incredibly interesting cat. I mean, it's like yeah. I've often wondered, like, if I, you know, you you have a wish list of people you wish you could get on the podcast. I mean, I've, clearly, you know, nowadays, if you were to if you were to even speak to him, people would say you you know you're platforming a fascist and stuff like that. But I've always been of the view, I've always been very interested in looking at the perspective of people that live a lifestyle or have chosen to go down a particular path that mm. I would never in a million years go down myself. Like, I don't know whether you know uh, Louis Theroux. But a lot of the, you know, weird weekends uh, documentaries with Louis Theroux, you know, where he would go spend like a week, uh, two, three weeks with, um, you know, porn stars. Or he would spend time with pro wrestlers or he'd spend time with neo-Nazis and stuff like that. I always watch that with kind of the same interest that I have sometimes when I speak to people. It's like you're doing something that I, I you know, I myself would never have the opportunity to do or potentially even want to do. But it's interesting to get a sense of what what's the thought process that you have as yeah. you make the life decisions that get you to the place where you are, Varg is for sure somebody where that you know where that that would apply in my view. The Absolutely. other thing is, mu musically, he he is a fucking genius. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that I don't like in the 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 Burzum discography. I mean, a lot of the 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 later stuff, the the ambient stuff is not 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 my thing. But then you get these moments on those first records, on you know, especially on Philosophem, in my view. That's just so fucking good. I mean, I can put on Dunkelite now, and it has exactly the same effect on me as when I first heard it. I totally agree. I totally agree. Uh, fun fact about him is that he he got out of prison and he started jumping into making Bursum albums again. You know, uh, metal black metal Bursum albums, and he mm. did it in the same studio as he did before he went into prison, and he did it until the studio shut down. And when the studio shut down, he just quit making making metal records. He just started making ambient stuff on his wife's computer instead. So he's he's a guy. He don't don't fix it if it ain't broken. But if it is broken, he won't do it anymore. It's a bit. It's a funny little twist. He could probably go to a different studio, but he just didn't care to. Yeah, yeah, because he did the. Um... He did the uh, was it called from the depths of darkness? It was like those re-recordings of a lot of the older songs, and yeah. I I I really liked that. I thought it was very very cool. I thought he's I I actually thought that some of those tracks, the the different approach that he took to the vocals, I think actually really really worked. The one that I th um, uh, that I think about in particular is uh, a lost forgotten sad spirit. Um, I yeah. thought I thought the the version on from the depths of darkness was better than uh than the original and then obviously i know he did bellus as well um i mean i remember listening to that record and, and and quite liking it um that's one of my favorites actually yeah i i, I mean it's yeah. really really good it's 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 a more kind of cohesive record i feel than than some of the, uh, the early stuff like the early stuff have peaks that are unbelievably high and then as i said you know there's some throwaway stuff in between but that that record was definitely end to end a very engaging you know very very solid solid listen i i can't get enough of belus belus and fallen the, those two albums <clears throat> has been really important to me in the later years uh, it's mm. uh, in my mind it's perfect black metal albums yeah um 
and then mayhem uh your your thoughts on the mayhem discography or at least your your journey of discovery that you went through with mayhem because they so so i mentioned the bands i discovered first but i think the band that you know now for me is kind of the the probably not just of norwegian black metal but of all black metal the the absolute gods are, are, are mayhem i mean i i've I've been a fan of Ordo at Ko. I've been a fan of Esoteric Warfare. I love Demon, you know. So every all the stuff that some of the people, some people kind of thumb their nose at in the later years, to me is magic. I think, I mean, especially Ordo at Ko. I think it's a record that a lot of people struggled with, but it's a work of genius, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I was a bit surprised when that came out. I I, um, I was spoiled by the previous couple of albums, uh, sound wise. And then all of a sudden, uh, this came out, and I was like, "Wow, I expected a different production." I must say, but uh, my mayhem is the Blasphemer era. Hmm. Yeah, it's Wolf Slayer Abyss. Uh, what the fuck is it called again? A Grand Declaration of Grand War. Grand Declaration of War. Yeah, uh, and uh, Chimera is a fucking perfect album. That is yeah. probably my favorite album. If I need have to pick one, it has to be Chimera. So, amidst all this discovery, at what point did you did you pick up a guitar? The guitar came along uh, in the Sex Pistols days. Oh, really? Okay, so you were kind of evolving on through the music you were listening to at the time. Absolutely. And as far as knowing you wanted to start a band and 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 play music, when did that uh, when did that happen? That happened at the age thirteen as well. Actually, um, I started playing with uh, a couple of fellas. And uh, as I told you, no metal in Halden, so most kids were listening to punk. So we we started a punk band, you know. Mm. So I've been playing punk for many many years, and I think that's important too. If you are a young person go, go, getting into rock and roll in general, punk rock is actually really important because you, it's it's gritty, it's uh, harsh, it has some attitude, and it's simple, you know. And uh, simple is usually good, in my opinion. Uh, I'm not the Yngve Malmsteen uh, kind of guy. I'm more into a few chords that sound true, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, 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 it. We were talking about ACDC earlier. I, I, and I'm with you there. I, I, I'm a big believer. I, what I, I, I love when a note has meaning. I'd rather somebody literally plays like three notes. But the notes all have like a very specific intent. There's like a there's genuine impact to it, rather than somebody who you know is all over the place. It's part of why I don't like technical death metal very much. Yeah, there's it's not exceptions. only just to cut you off. It's not just that. Is that if you play just a few chords, it's the thing is the way or strumming and the way at least for my my sake, the way I'm shaking the strings a little bit with the fingers. That has a lot to say about the feel. Everyone can play some chords and let them ring, you know, but you can easily hear when there's a feel there. And that yeah. is what uh, that is what differs ACDC from everyone. They have the feeling in each fucking hit and strum they do. If you listen to a band like uh, what's the new the copycats of ACDC, Airborne. I'm sorry to say I can't stand that stuff. Oh, it's that is dreadful. That is I was I was about to say torture for me. <laughs> yeah. But no, there, 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 there is a very distinct difference in I, I mean again, I, I mean, this is a distinction between some modern music and some older stuff as well. Not necessarily metal so much, but certainly like that that kind of harder rock. Um, you know, there's there was a feeling in a lot of those older bands, whether it's Rolling mm -hmm. Stones, whether it's Kiss whether it's ACDC, that it's just absent from a lot of bands like that today. You know, I don't I don't feel like there's a lot of very accessible rock bands. The only exception in my mind, really, is Queens of the Stone Age and maybe some yeah. of the projects and some of the bands that are kind of in that orbit. But beyond that, there's not a huge amount that's very exciting in, um, you know, now they would call it alternative rock, but you know what I mean, kind of that that has yeah. that kind of rock sensibility from the 1970s and the, you know, I, I I have to admit that uh, Songs for the Deaf is a go-to record for me. Uh, that is one I, I have in it. my vinyl. I have it in the vinyl collection, and I play it quite often, actually. And uh, Josh Hom, he actually has his own sound, too. You can tell that it's him. Uh, all, you can say what you, what you want about the guy, but uh, all 
he needs some cred, you know. He has done his own thing. Only only love for him on this on this podcast, yeah. mate. I if I could choose to be able to sing like any one particular man, I would I would say replace my vocal cords with Josh's immediately. <laughs> he is absolutely fucking incredible. And that record in particular, I mean, yeah. it's it's like start to finish perfect and also yeah. it's perfect because it's you, you mentioned like josh has his own sound but everyone playing on that record has their own sound dave Grohl's yeah. drums of have a very distinct he's got a very distinct way of interpreting and, and delivering groove uh nick oliveri's bass is fucking excellent josh sounds awesome his guitar playing is fucking genius you've got mark lanigan coming in over the top and then you've got songs that like you know that rock pretty hard first it giveth to me is mm. masterpiece i listen to it at least probably three four times a week I like to the point where my my girlfriend doesn't listen to the music i listen to whatsoever she knows the song like the back of her hand and then you've got these really beautiful like slower songs like um the sky is falling um mosquito song at the end of the record i mean uh, like i said it's faultless flawless 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 record first they giveth that is my one yeah no first 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 it giveth is to me that's the that that is that is the song and, um, uh hanging tree too <laughs> yeah yeah no, i know i i love it and i mean they, they've done really great stuff after that but they they i don't think josh has ever really managed to top songs for the day not, uh, not for consistency i haven't really heard all the albums after that but i did hear one track from the album after that one uh what's it that called is it um like clockwork or something no, no, like Clockwork came a few records after. Uh, Lullaby is to Paralyze. Okay, then it's like Clockwork. And on there, there's one song that I absolutely love, and that is called If I Had a Tail. Great song as well, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Easy. So when I had, uh, when I, for whatever reason, when I had COVID and I was really, really like, I mean, feeling like complete utter garbage, myself and my, my girlfriend were bedridden for about 10 days. I think I uh, was going through a, a rabbit hole on YouTube looking at like old, um, like unplugged shows that Queens of the Stone Age did. I, I stumbled upon a fantastic unplugged set that uh, Josh did in good quality, where he did If I Had a Tail, you know, he did really like all the best, all the best Queens of the Stone Age stuff. I need to check that out. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll for sure have to send you a link, but um, yeah, yeah do great, that. great stuff. Um, so yeah, so so interesting though that you you, you were mentioning about um, you know that feeling and the simplicity. One thing that I, I, I certainly noted from Cathedralen was a lot of the a lot of the things that I liked about more previously was very much intact. And you, you mentioned the hooks at the start of the conversation, you know, and it's you know that record is chock full of them. But your compositions have definitely become more complex and more intricate, like like. You sound to me on Cathedral in particular, and actually on the on the EP as well, like a much much more confident player than you than you were on the earlier Mork records. Is is that a fair observation? Do you think to make? I yes, absolutely. It sounds this way, but it is um, it is deliberate. Uh, if you listen back to the first albums and up towards Cathedral or even the new one. Uh, each album is seems to be opening up more and more uh, creative wise mm. because the first couple of albums I was trying to fit in and I wasn't trying to do anything but I I, um, I was following my own set strict black metal rules I wanted it to be primitive I wanted it to be, to be simple um, and then after a while I, I I don't want to repeat myself so I decided just to let creativity bloom in a way, you know. What happens, happens. If I write a riff and the next riff is like this or that, I just let it happen now. I don't think, oh, is this black metal enough? It Does it fit into the mold, you know? So that, that is what you have heard now on Cathedral. It's me just uh, dropping expectations and rules, basically, just letting myself go. What um what made you decide to do that? Because again, it's a. I think the thing that I love the most about black metal in the modern age, and I, I want to talk a little bit about that in more detail in a second. But I do love the fact that there's so much creative freedom in black metal. Like there's a lot of, you know, black metal is not any, you know, it's not kind of 
the the carbon copy of Nemesis Divina or De Mysteries of Satanas that it used to be. You know, like every band felt they needed to follow that same uh, that same kind of structure, and you don't have that anymore, really. Um, you know, bands are doing so many different, interesting things. I I still credit Gall to a to a degree with that because I think when they did Twilight of the Idols and Ad Maiorum Satanas Glorium, like there was. You know, I remember him talking in interviews about what black metal meant, and he was, you know, he would always say freedom. And it, it yep. feels to me like that ethos has been adopted by a lot of bands nowadays. But for you personally, that step change to start being a lot more open and bringing in some of these these outside influences, of, you know, you, you're clearly a guy that's got a broad taste in music. What, um, what sparked that? Just that I... I discovered after writing a few songs, like I told you, just opening up and letting uh, the, uh, the inspiration flow and the riffing go, you know, and then I just discovered that this is actually the sound of Mork. What I do automatically just becomes what Mork is now, to me, anyway. So uh, it's, uh, it's authentic and natural, and uh, that has become an important part for me, and uh, before I released Cathedral, I was uh, really anxious about how it was going to be received, you know, by critics and uh, fans and uh, listeners in general, because it was like me just letting go. And uh, will I lose people? Will will I win people? What will happen, you know? And uh, it came out and it got, to, seems like it's, the re reception has been good on that one. Uh, and now we are at the, the doorstep of a new album release. And I'm right back to zero again. I'm anxious and uh, a bit curious about what, how it will be received, you know. Um, that That's the price I have to pay for being so openly creative-wise. I'm not delivering a black metal product to you. I'm delivering Mork to you, if you know what I yeah, mean. Yeah, yeah. Do you find that fans are still because again you you experience them in a different or you experience feedback from your audience in a different way to you know what I would see it like I'm an outside observer looking at what people say. Mm. I, I I certainly got a sense from you know people that listen to my podcast that they you know Cathedral and was a record that they loved. Um, you are incidentally also one of the most requested guests on the show. Um, wow, thank you. Which is which is which which is good. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know I. I I, I don't think I've seen probably more positivity towards Mork than I saw for, for Cathedral. And, 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 you know, people also love the EP. But do you kind of still get a sense of a lot of conservatism amongst um, some of your audience, you know, or do you think your audience has kind of grown up and become a bit more um, receptive to it as you have matured as a, as a musician? There will always be naysayers in either what you do, you know. The, that's just how the world works, you know. Everyone doesn't vote for the same politician. That's just how it is. But uh, I think I don't want to call them fans. Let's call them supporters. Uh, it, the Morg supporters, they choose to be there or not, you know. If they don't like it, they will probably just listen to something else. Um, but I, I've been receiving a lot of uh, positive feedback. Uh, I can I can tell by the shows we are performing. You know, you can we have a connection with the uh, with the crowd, and they are uh, recognizing songs and stuff and singing along. Even we played in uh, South America now in uh, September, and uh, people were like shouting lyrics without knowing the language. You know, and. Uh, you know that's that's a touching thing. <laughs> you're starting you're yeah. starting to hit like Rammstein levels now. So, I suppose so. Du I was about to say it, it, always the craziest thing about seeing Rammstein play is you know you, I've seen them you're in the UK a couple of times. I in ninety percent of the people are singing every word like it's like their native language and they have no idea what they're singing. <laughs> so. Yeah, but the beauty I don't I'm not a fan of uh, Rammstein, but the beauty for them is that it's extremely simplicity and that will hit. Yeah. The masses. That's yeah, just how yeah, it is. Yeah. So, with this new with this new record, you mentioned kind of being, you know, or having at least a sense of anticipation of what people are going to say about it. Um, what 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 is giving you that sense of anticipation? Because I, I unfortunately I've not had a chance to listen to the record yet. I think Simon did send me the um, he did send me the promo. 
Um, yep. I've just not had a chance to 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 probably listen to it. Work has been too too insane, but I I, I also want to be able to spend proper time with it rather than just kind of having it on in the background. But is it a is it a natural continuation from the EP from Cathedral? Is it is it maybe more of sort of a, uh, a step forward for you or, or a, 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 an expansion of the Mork palette? I was yeah, I would say so. It's a continuation. It's the next step. Uh, so if you listen to my albums in um, in um, chron chrono chronological order, you will you will hear each step. You know, and uh, I don't know. It's uh, hard to describe. It's just what came out of me when I re recorded this, and uh, there is some uh, atmosphere in there. There's some harshness. I try. One point for me is that to make albums varied. Uh, that's important. I don't want to make just a transylvanian hunger you know from start mm. to end even though i love that album to to, to bits but uh variation is important to me and uh, i think i have this on the new one too i, I achieved uh, quite a bit of a variation there in terms of the recording and things like that it, it, was it a similar process to what you followed previously did you do anything different mm, no same uh, same procedure you 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 record at home, do you not, or have you got a studio that you go to? I have a home studio, and uh, I uh, get help when I whenever I need it. I'm not a big tech guy, so uh, each album is mixed in a different studio. Yeah, yeah. Now I know you you mentioned playing in Lat uh, Latin American or Lat oh, sorry, I was about to say Latam because I'm I'm too immersed in work. You know, we, we when we talk <laughs> about like different markets, it's like a oh, Latam market. <laughs> you mentioned playing in, in Latin America last year. Um, and I, I know you played at, at Wacken as well. That must be like, oh, how to talk to me about how it feels having been a fan, most likely having watched you know all these Wacken videos and seeing like bands you really like playing on it and thinking what it would be like to be on stage. What does it feel like when you walk on stage for the first time and you see that massive crowd in front of you and you kind of realize, like, okay, I'm on the exact same stage. As all of these bands I've looked up to for years and years and years, uh, Vakken was obviously a bucket list uh, from the get go. Uh, when we started as a live band in uh, 2014, I think at the end of 2014, Vakken was like on the top on the list. And uh, to finally be able to play there after uh, being on the poster for I think two years in a row because of the pandemic, we were on the poster for 2020 for the first time, you know. And then I got to know that uh, when they were renewing or moving the festival, they were actually changing some bands. So there was a possibility that we would we would uh, lose the spot, you know. But uh, luckily, we kept it. And uh, when I actually played there, it was it was basically a regular Morg show in my mind. But before and after, it was like you know we played Vakken, and uh, I don't know that was. Um, like I told you, a bucket list. And uh, it was a goal that I had set for myself many years ago. And, uh, you know, just uh, move on to the next uh, big thing, you know, try to keep your goals high and uh, try to achieve them. But uh, the Vakken experience was great. Even just uh, hanging around in the backstage area, going out, we, we caught... Um, we didn't see a lot of concerts, but we we caught uh, Merciful Fate, and that was fucking awesome, you know, on the main stage there. Mm -hmm. And then I got to see how big this is, and uh, I don't know, is is it eighty thousand people or something? It's a bit too big for me as an audience member and a Norwegian hermit black metal guy, but uh, overwhelming to be there and see it, you know, uh, fucking great organized festival, professional. You didn't you didn't get to meet the king, did you? I actually, I almost met Rob Halford because he, um, he, 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 we were taking, um, there was a food bu buffet backstage and uh, me and Rob were uh, taking food at the same time, but I never talked to him. I would just mm -hmm. leave him be, just watched him go, you know, <laughs> uh, actually on the day after, uh, Merciful Fate was supposed to play in Bergen and uh, there were some delays with their flights. So mm. something got fucked up for Merciful Fate, and we ended up on the same plane as um, uh, Hank Sherman. Is that the name? 
Yeah. Yeah, the guitar player. Yeah. So we we said hello to him, you know. So that that was the closest to get get to the king this time around. <laughs> The, I, I do love like I mean I I didn't see Merciful Fate but I did see King Diamond a couple of years ago when he was doing the the Abigail um, record like back to back, and I do love the production of it. I mean you know especially when they do um, Melissa and when they do come to the Sabbath. You know you have got the big pentagram kind of coming up with the lights in the back. It, it's always it, it has always felt to me like Ghost is a it's like a poor man's version of Merciful Fate. It's why I've never been able to get into to to Ghost. I'm like all oh, you fucking nerds are, are you know freaking out about this band merciful fate was doing the shit in the 80s uh yeah. you know, and doing it way better as well yeah but you know uh tobias he is uh, he's very good at writing hooks and uh, songs so you know people will like it yeah no no very much so so you know i mentioned earlier i want to talk a little bit about kind of modern black metal and you know it's very obvious from your music and from you know the the guys that you have on your podcast you know you're very deeply ensconced and have great affection for the old god what is your thoughts on where the like where the scene where the genre is now i think that um black metal has become a really wide uh, wide term a yeah. wide genre big span with different approaches to the music and uh, imagery and everything, and I think that's really good and really healthy. That that makes the palette even bigger, you know. And uh, there's something for each occasion and something for each person, I suppose. You know, you you have the the most truest of the true cult guys, you know, and then you have I don't know something like. Um, you mentioned the cradle of filth and some symphonic stuff you know you have everything and um i don't know i think it's good i ha i don't have that much opinion of it i'm mostly just um what should i say i'm j mainly paying attention and focusing on uh, what i'm doing on my own you know and so in terms of new music what 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 does come out that excites you um you know in in 2022 2023 um you know whether it's whether that be black metal or, or or any you know anything else across any other genre. Oh, I'm I'm a terrible person, uh, Jackie. I uh, don't listen to new music. <laughs> I uh, I listen. You know what? When I'm if I'm relaxing or need some background music, having a party, whatever, I I put on uh, Rainbow Rising, uh, Dark Side of the Moon. Songs for the deaf, mm. you know. <laughs> I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I go backwards and not forwards. I'm, I'm stuck back in time in the past, you know. Yeah, yeah. Now, I was gonna, I was about to ask you what your thoughts were on, you know, Nishan saying, you know, the, the, the weekend is darker than a lot of black metal coming out now. But I'll, uh, I, w I won't put you in a difficult spot of having to, uh, have, have, having to answer that. I will say, I do think that uh, now black metal to me right now. Having been a fan now for a good, you know, twenty plus years, I think it's in the most ex one of the most exciting spots that it's ever been. Um, yeah. There are, I think, a lot of the symphonic stuff is sort of, I mean, it's still there. You know, people still listen to Gretel Filth and Dimmer Borger and stuff like that. I've, I never liked it. It's too, it's too saccharine to me. It's too, too, it's too, too nice. So that's gone now, in my in my view, because it's been replaced by stuff that is just way darker, way more menacing, way more aggressive. Um, you know, bands like Eccles, uh, uh Panzerfaust, you know, bands like that that have kind of taken the extreme side of black metal, pushed it that much further. Um, but they can still sort of, you know, you can still hear there's clearly roots back to the back to the old masters. You know, uh, yeah. and El Nathrak is a great example of that as well. Um, maybe not the last El Nathrak album so much, but everything prior to that, you know, it still has that real sort of confrontational feel that that a lot of the old black metal bands had. Um, but it's like you know, it's kind of ratcheting up the intensity level of it even even more than um, you know than it than it was previously. Yeah, I'm not sure about uh, that Ishan comment. I actually have heard the same thing, not uh, directly from him, but I think I read about it or something. Uh, I don't know. I think that's a silly thing to say. Uh, I'm I'm a big opposer of uh, black metal bands needing to be controversial or having extreme. 
views and statements in order to be a true band that is something that i am struggling with because i am i'm 100 percent into the art you know and uh of course i have my own feelings and ideas about things but i keep that to myself you know and people people should listen to the music and if they get atmosphere and vibe from that that's great but i don't feel that i need to pretend to be you know a boogeyman of a sort you yeah, know? That's yeah, yeah. The, and when i'm pushing 40 it becomes a bit childish to behave like that too so uh that those are my two cents on the on that topic. <laughs> so, what were your thoughts uh, in, in, in on, on on along that track? Well, what were your thoughts on the that Twilight of the Idols at Majorum era of Gorgoroth? Because that to me was like the first real like shock that black metal was able to unleash upon the world. You know, probably since the controversy with Varg and with um, Euronymous and things like that. Like, I, I, I mean, it, it, it really like, I, cause I saw the, I didn't see the full show when they, when they did that tour year in the UK, all they had was the barbed wire. And I think they had the sheep's heads and they had the, they had the torches, but they didn't have the crucified women and, and things like that. But it, it really was like abrasive and, in, and, 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 and in your face. And I do agree with you to, a, to, to a point. Like I think the shock value, I think there's a point where it becomes cartoonish. It needs to feel whatever you do has to feel authentic. Um, mm -hmm. I have views on the Gorgoroth that that era of Gorgoroth, but I, I'm curious to hear your your take on that. Are we talking about the naked people on the crosses and uh, yeah. and the violence, uh, the violent uh, charges uh, on the private uh, yeah, yeah, side? Yeah, yeah. It becomes the same as what Mayhem did in the early days, you know. It's a mm. bit of a repetition of that, but uh, hey, it's extreme metal. I I get it, you know. But another thing, uh, the the last album you mentioned there, uh, Gloriam album, uh, is fucking excellent. I a love genius. that album, absolute genius. And I, I'm I'm so bummed out that I can't find it anywhere. Yeah, uh, I, I I don't know why they don't have. Um... I don't know why why it's not available anywhere because it came out on Regain Records, I think. Yeah, I and... think that's because of the di dispute between the band members and the and the, and the court case and everything. Yeah, you it know, it, uh, it, 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 it was well, a shame there was a dispute to begin with because they to me like they were like elite of the elite. I I I, I like Twilight of the Idols almost as much as I like uh, Admiorum and Satanus Glorium, but they are two completely genius records. There's a song on there called Exit, which yeah. uh, if, I will never forget. I don't get it out of my head, you know. It's a great fucking song. Well, it has, uh, that, it has, a, it has that crazy ending, which like comes out of nowhere, but it's so, you know, you talk about hooks. Um, yeah. It has what I think is Gaul, one of Gaul's fi finest moments. Um, and then if you yeah, like that when they when they re-release the record, there's like a slight extension to the ending, and he like goes from like a scream to like a like like singing, and it just sounds yeah. it sounds even more sinister than when it just sort of fades out, which, which is what it did on the original record. But yeah, no, I uh, I, I, I love it. No, uh, Christian or Gal, he has a fantastic uh, voice and a, a great span in his voice too, and he's a he's a good great per performer. And uh, I, I enjoy what he's doing, you know. He he knows his shit, and uh, he's a true artist, I would say. You know, it blew me away uh, when I spoke to him. He 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 told me that when he writes, uh, when he when he's recording, he doesn't he doesn't have lyrics written. He just goes into the studio and sings over the song. He says he's oh. got like an idea in the back of his mind about what he wants to say or what he wants to sing. But that's it. Mm. There's no, there aren't written lyrics. He doesn't have anything that's kind of prepared beforehand. He just goes wow. in and he just starts singing. With that, that fucking blew me away. Because it was yeah. right when I spoke to him was when the Humming Mountain uh, that single came out. Mm. Um, you know, and that's a that's a reasonably like 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 musically, it's a complex song. I don't know lyrically if it's a particularly complex song, but it's like you, you're going to need to have your, you know, you have you have your wits about you when you're in the studio recording that. And he told me, yeah, he did that in one take, <laughs> which is just fucking nuts. The beauty about black metal, in my mind, I remember in the early days uh, reading inside the you know uh, CD booklets and reading the lyrics for Dark Throne and the Bursum uh, albums and lyrics. That 
the lyrics are poems, you know, hmm. and they can be really short and they can be long. I, I, that is something I really do enjoy uh, creating on my own is the lyrics are written as poems uh, separately and I just combine them with some music, you know. Mm. And I don't do what Gal does. I don't go in there without any papers or anything, but um, I don't have any rhythm set for the lyrics when I'm recording my vocals. I, I'm just cramming it in there, you know, and just try to spread it out across the entire tune you know just to have it being evenly placed but most of the time it works you know you you are good at that though um i i there's a couple of things where i i can be very pedantic one is around drumming uh i hate drums that's you know where you have blast beats it literally just sounds like it's there's no variation it's just blasting you know they're not doing rolls and fills and not making it interesting i i can't stand that the other thing i can't stand when it comes to black metal are vocalists that are it that it, it sounds like they're screaming into a wind tunnel there's no there's no kind of rhythm there's no pace there's no there's nothing about the voice that sort of makes it that additional instrument which you know for yeah. me the best best black metal vocalists you know have that in spades and uh, you know compliment to you 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 are very very good at, very good at that and even more impressive if you're if you've written the lyrics and you just have to kind of figure out a way to fit them in because yep. there's there's a couple of moments on cut Rollin that i can recall where you know as i said you, you sort of almost had that vocal hook that you have with like um i sometimes liken it to hip-hop because i think it, it it's it's most readily applicable old school hip-hop there it was all about the vocal hook some of the best death metal songs you know you think about like the first dsi record it's about the vocal hook and actually in in black metal uh, you have a fair bit of that as well um i mean i was even listening to the new venomous concept record today and there's like a there's something that kevin sharp sings on the first track and it's like something about like un unleash the beast of misery but the way that he phrases it makes the song like 10 times better than it ordinarily would have been if he was just sort of being lazy with the way his vocals were phrased on top of the riff. Yeah. I, you just have to work uh, by chance and feel the tune, you know, and feel the words. It's I, I don't think if you ask a painter how he is painting freehand or freestyle, he can't really explain to you what he's doing, you know. You just let the, the strokes fill the screen, you know. That's just how it works. So you mentioned being a uh, uh, being a Norwegian hermit as you close in on your fortieth birthday. So outside of of making grim and necro black metal, what is your you know what does life consist of for you? Can you keep that thought and I just pick up a new beer and uh, have a whisk? Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Be right back. No worries, man. Sorry about that, man. No worries, man. No, 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 no problem at all. What are you drinking over there? Uh, my favorite beer, Camden Hells. Um, if you come to the UK again, it's a it's a microbrewery that they have. I think actually in Camden. Oh um, yeah, but yeah, awesome, really, really nice, nice tasting beer. I, I'm I'm more of a wine drinker than I'm a beer drinker, but I love me some Camden Hells. I suppose they have that one on tap, perhaps at the the Dev. They do. Um, they have it at the Underworld as well. Yeah, I actually played the Underworld once. Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would imagine Mork is kind of is the size the way if you came to the UK you would play the Underworld. That would be amazing. I I, I remember we were um, we weren't headlining. We were playing. Uh, I think it was a ton of bands. We were playing third on the bill or something. And after us, it was um, you know the old school um, Swiss band uh, Root. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I know Root. And I got to know and talk to the boss. Oh, no, big boss. Sorry. <laughs> I almost thought you were guys. about to say uh, Samuel, but uh, uh, they, they, their glory days are well and truly behind them, unfortunately. Um, uh, we are actually sharing management uh, at the moment, which is a compliment. Oh, really? Yeah, my I have I have a manager guy who is helping me a bit, and he is the manager of Samuel and been for many many years, and emperor. Yeah. Well, main thing that he needs to let the Emperor guys know is Samoth needs to do another Wretched End record because uh, I think those albums, those three records he did with Wretched End are criminally underrated. Um, yep. And uh, it's, I, you know, 
even if it means sacrificing an emperor to a <laughs> go go and make another one of those wretched end albums they, they are brilliant they there's, actually there's a... had they're actually heading out a bit now i can tell they are uh, announcing new tours uh, for each day now it seems yeah i mean i, I know they're going to do the anthems to the welcome at dusk tour now they're doing that you know in end to end um i really liked anthems to the welcome at dusk but again i i i mean personally i have more in more of an interest in hearing new music from samoth than i than i have in you know emperor playing another tour um yeah I'm sure I'm in the minority about that, but you know that's my that's my view. Ishan's own music that he puts out, I have no interest in anymore. I, I think that my observation has been for the longest time that Emperor worked because of the combination of of those two guys. You had the creativity of of Ishan, and it was kind of brought into line with the aggression and the uh, the steely dedication to to extremity and badassness that Samoth brings to the table. Um, that's why they that's why it worked so well on those older records. But I, I feel like without Samoth there, Ishan is kind of he's just he's his music becomes too self-indulgent. Uh a funny thing about Ishan is that he's his previous backing band um started their own thing on the side, if I'm not getting this wrong now. And they uh, are now actually bigger than ever uh without him. And they are called leprous. I'm sure I've, I've I'm sure I've come across them before. Um, I think they are his previous backing band, actually, and they just broke out on their own and made their own band and became big as hell. Said we, uh, we're, we're not down with any more of this. Uh, yeah, leprous is a Norwegian black metal band from uh, Notterden, formed in 2001. The band was founded by singer and keyboardist. Einar Solberg and guitarist Tor Odman Surka, and apologies for for uh, massacring your your language. Lefris performing <laughs> in 2017 during their Molina tour. Um, why have I not listened to enough of their stuff yet? Uh, it's quite. Uh, I think it's quite proggy, uh, prog rock. They are like really, um, what's it called? They are um, good musicians, to put it like that. Yeah, I see. But it sounds good. I see on the 25th of January 2019, they released a cover of Angel by Massive Attack, which I do like that song very much. I like Massive Attack generally very, very much. Yeah, there you go. Um, but so anyway, so as, as we were saying, so, uh, you know, as you kind of approach the age, of the, the ripe old age of 40, you know, you mentioned being a bit of a Norwegian hermit. So life outside of black metal for you, what does that look like, um, day, you know, day to day? What, what, what are the stuff that you occupy your time with outside of uh, music? Ah, normal stuff, I would say. Uh, I have a day job. Always had a day job. Uh, I have a house. I uh, have a fiance. I have uh, two stepchildren. And I have uh, three cats. Uh, and I have some buddies here and there, you know. I do the regular stuff. I don't hang upside down in a cave and drink blood. I'm sorry to say. So I was about to say, no, you don't dedicate daily time to worship Satan, or <laughs> of course I do. Every morning and every evening. That's just how it is. See the flag? Oh, I, I, that was the first thing I spotted. That um, is actually that is actually a gift from a very good friend of mine. Uh, most people in Norway, at least, uh, know about uh, Helvete, the old shop, you know. Mm -hmm. But after Helvete, there came along a new shop called The Wolf's Lair. Have you heard about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It used to be in Oslo, and then it was in Stavanger, and then it moved around a bit. I'm not sure where it is now. But uh, the guy who runs that shop gave me that flag as a gift recently. That is why it's on the wall. So, it, it, uh, it, big... it, it, does, it does suit the mood of the room very nicely as well. Uh, it's pretty black in here. <laughs> <laughs> So, so if you don't mind me asking the day job, what is that? Uh, I have actually been working at a body shop for cars uh, since I was... Fuck, how old was I? I? I started working at a body shop in 2003 or something. So I'm 20 oh, wow. years now. Yeah. And what got you down that... Uh, what, what, what got you into that racket? Mm, my father... He did it. He he run. Uh, he did did run a business, and he pulled me by the hair over there when I quit school. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, I was finished uh, studying. I didn't give a fuck anymore. And then he just pulled me into his workshop. And I've been there ever since. Uh, not at his place, though, because he died a few years back. But I'm still working at a body shop. Yeah. And and you personally, are, are you a fan of cars? No, not really. <laughs> That's a funny thing because I don't give a shit about cars. Uh, I, yeah. Most of the time, I have no idea about what kind of car I'm working on. But yeah. I'm 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 good at what I do. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And the the folks over at the uh, at the shop where you work do they do they know what you get up to uh, when you're on stage or when you're you know when you're playing music? Uh, luckily, I, I have uh, leaders or uh, management that uh, that uh, CEO is maybe the word that uh, think it's kind of cool what I'm doing. So they are giving me time off when I need you know and. Uh, People are wearing the shirts and stuff. It is, they, I think they're thinking they think it's a fun thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, I. So, so I mean, I work a highly, highly corporate job, and it's always interesting. You know, I'll do a. I, so it, I, I have two accounts that I run, and both of the accounts have in excess of one has two hundred eighty-five people on, and another has about hundred and hundred and five. Not that all directly report into me, but ultimately sit under my, sit under my remit. And it is pretty funny going on a meeting and, uh, you know, from time to time I'll wear a death shirt or wear a dark throne shirt or anything like, or something like that. And you get the odd person because in a team that big, st you know, statistically there'll be one or two people that know what you, you know, 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 know what they're seeing. I was just like seeing I am coming through on teams like, hey, I'm a big fan of this band. Like, you know, well, I check out, I, I listen to the podcast. Or something like that. So that's, uh, that is, that is pretty cool. Very different to what it used to be like. Like I said, I grew up in South Africa. Um, almost everything that I told you about now was like completely and utterly, you know, not, not forbidden by the government as much, but the religious right over there. If you listen to ACDC, you're a Satanist immediately. If yeah. you were, if you progressed on to Black Sabbath, I mean, there was literally no hope for you. And by the time you get to like um, Deerside and, you know, Morbid Angel, and as I get, they're not actually in the reference books that these people use to decide what music is permissible and what not. So you kind of get a free pass on those. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's 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 a very very different experience from what I think a lot of folks had in in Europe and in the UK in particular. Um, what like the, uh, where highly the, religious. Where where are you in Johannesburg or Cape Town or? No, I so I grew up in a place called Bloemfontein. Uh, and Bloemfontein is uh, really out in the middle of nowhere. It's a it's a dump as far. Well. I mean, now I don't. I will. I'll never go there again. Uh, where, whenever I do go visit, which is once a year, I go to Cape Town, and then there's a little town um, to the I think the south of Cape Town called Hermanus. I go there. But Bloemfontein, the only real claim to fame that it has, aside from the, being the place of my birth, uh, is uh, it was also where J.R. Tolkien was born. And he lived there until he was two years old, and then uh, him and his family packed up, and I think they moved to the UK. Um, wow. But yeah, that's that's the only, literally the only claim to fame that it has. But, but for the most but, part, shit hole. Yeah, I've never been down there, so I need to ask: Is this like jungle? Is it savanna? What what are we talking here? So Bloemfontein is is uh, it's probably more like desert than than anything else. I mean, not not entirely, but it's certainly not jungle or savanna. When you get down to the coast. Um, it's got it, it's it's got a very distinct climate. There's something called um, feinbos, a fine bush uh, that you have that, that grows all over the place, um, and it has a very distinct smell. There's very distinct like sounds from from like the the, the bugs and the beetles and stuff that are that that nest in them. Um, it's it's like no other place I can I can describe to anybody. Um, hmm. And uh, you know that part of the country in particular, the the Western Cape, is incredible. If you if you like meat and you like you know red wine and you like animals, um, which I would assume you like all three, that's there's few few better places in the world you can go to. And the other great thing is, especially if you're coming from Europe, um, the exchange rate counts strongly in your favor. So you can have a fantastic holiday. Um, and it doesn't really cost you. All, it, it'll cost you a reasonable amount of money, but you're not going to, you know, be uh, be begging for change when you come home afterwards. Uh, oh, the, you know, it's, it's, the, the expensive part is probably the flight, I suppose. Yeah, um, but again, you know, if you fly with uh, with Emirates or a place like or, or an airline like that, you know, you it, it can it's reasonably affordable. Uh, direct flights can be quite expensive. 
Um, we have a direct flight from the UK that takes about 11 and a half hours to get there. Um, but it's not, um, it's not, it's, it doesn't break the bank too badly. Um, I am enjoying it whilst I can, because, you know, you never know when they're going to start imposing travel restrictions on people hit, hitched to their, their carbon footprint and all of this other bullshit. But, um, yeah, for now it's a, it's an annual trek. I still have, you know, my mom and dad still live there, so it's nice to see them. But uh, it is particularly nice to just, just to, to live the good life for three or four weeks. One uh, one last question about that: Is there any danger of wild animals? No, none at no. all. So the, the, you can go to a lot of game reserves, um, and in the, and the, the game reserves, you know, you can see. Like I I, I spent in, the, in my last holiday this past December, I went on safari, and I. Um, the the game reserve that they have there i think is 31 it's either 27 or 31000 acres where the the plan is to expand it but what they've done is they've they've kind of got a completely enclosed wild ecosystem there so the lions roam freely with um with all the other animals so we actually came across a female that was in the middle of a hunt when we were there um you know and she does the whole thing exactly like your cats would do when they're chasing a mouse or something where they like crouch and they start moving around it's incredible to see but um, no, you 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 never have an issue with wild animals. Um, in terms of uh, sharks, they 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 are quite prolific around the coast where I swim. But I've been going to the same beach for all of my life. There's never been a shark attack there. Um, there's been shark attacks further up the coast near a Cape Town, but that normally is surfers that go in. You know, when it's really really quiet, and they'll go you know kind of beyond the surf line. Uh, you know, if if you do that, you you kind of fucking around with the with in the in the in 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 the wrong place i have been shark age diving and i've seen sharks firsthand <laughs> it is incredible it's it's absolutely it's like one of the things that i would recommend most if you if you were to go to south africa is go shark age diving um but how yeah, is it uh, by uh, how is it with uh... yeah how you is this with metal gigs down there uh mostly rubbish mate uh i've joked about this on the podcast before it's kind of joking but also serious the i don't know what it is about south africa we do so many things very very well metal is not something that we're able to do very well there's there's one or two okay bands that are from there but for the most part the scene sucks there's there's people that go to shows and like they've had bands like behemoth come and play and i think i mean i believe the turnout was really good um but it's just not something that, like, in terms of our own scene, you know, like Australia has a very distinct vibe in the in the scene that they've got. It's you know super exciting. Poland has a great scene. France has a great scene. Obviously, Norway has a great scene. But in in South Africa, I don't know if if, if it's because people lend their talents to things like making food or playing rugby, but it's it's not. Also, the, it's just not something that they that they have a that they don't have a knack for doing it. So there's no chance of Morke getting booked down there then. <laughs> no, you never know. There's there's a there, I mean you could probably I'd reckon you could probably draw a decent, you know, 6 to 700 person crowd if you if you went to go play in Cape Town. Uh wow. it would depend on whether there's a booking agent that that's able to book you. Um yeah. you know, you guys don't have overtly satanic imagery and stuff in any of your albums or in your logo, so you you you'd be reasonably okay with that as well. Rotting Christ I think if I'm I, I speak under correction, but I know that I think they played there, and they had to change their name for the purposes of the tour to just rotting, because uh, yeah. otherwise they would have just been booted out of their uh, out, out of the venue. And I think sense. Behemoth got a bit of got a bit of stick as well. But then again, you know, Nurgle is uh, it's not my not my kind of guy, so I I, I don't I don't really care. <laughs> so <laughs> oh, well. cool. All right, brother. Well, listen. I am very much looking forward to hearing the full uh, new Mork record when it when it gets released. I think by the time this uh, episode will go up, which is in about two weeks from the time we're recording it, I, I, I may well have had the time to to pay it some proper attention. But I'm so glad we finally got a chance to have this conversation, and uh, you know, hopefully, catch up with you again at some point down the road. Uh, are you in London? I live outside of London, but um, you know, in under the right circumstances, I can make I can make my way into London. So if you're uh, if you are headed there at any point soon, then for sure drop me a line. Yeah, I should absolutely, definitely. We'll we'll have, we'll have some beers and uh, I'll show you some uh, some wildlife photos. I know if you if you have cats, inevitably you have to like lions. <laughs> so you got you got you got three mini lions in your house right now. So. Uh, that's true <laughs> all right my man uh, take care of yourself total pleasure thank you all right brother
。バイバイ。
You just listened to Bordgang by Mork of the upcoming record Dip Yet, which will be available through Peaceful Records on March the 24th. Uh, great track uh, by a great band, and I really want to say thank you very much to Thomas for being a awesome guest. Like I said, two years in the making. I don't think he disappointed, and uh, hopefully we will catch up with him again at some point down the road. But do make sure that you check out that record when it gets released. Right now, I want to talk about a, another new release, one which has been uh, met with a lot of anticipation by the metal fraternity at large. Uh, for me, as I said at the top of the show, I've been reasonably skeptical about it uh, for reasons I'll explain uh, again in a little bit. But um, before we talk about uh, the new Enslaved record, I think it's worth maybe just level setting. Because this is a band where, you know, debate rages so furiously about about their best music and uh, I think it feeds into potentially the, the the degree of substance or the degree of credibility that you should afford my review um, if I tell you what my favorite enslaved records are so if you disagree strongly then you can skip on to the news rant uh, and ignore what I say um, my favorite enslaved records are Frost number one uh, number two, uh, Axioma Ethica Odini from 2010, uh, and Issa from uh, 2004. Uh, I think that to me is absolute peak enslaved. And so when I talk about Heimdall, I'm kind of coming at it from that angle. I mean, in, in, in all honesty, I really like pretty much everything Enslaved has done. Uh, but there is one massive exception, and that was Utgard uh, that came out in 2020. I think that record is absolutely terrible. And, and if I'm very honest, I also didn't really like E very much, uh, the record that preceded that. So my skepticism over the new Enslaved album kind of comes from there. I try to listen and get into both E and Utgard many, many times, uh, you know, at the urging of friends who have great taste and, uh, you know, recommend it very highly. And no matter what I did, I just could not do so, um, you know, and I was kind of on board for, you know, what I deemed to be their more experimental stuff like Retier, um, you know, even in times I thought was a superb record, um, you know, and I've kind of been, you know, I, I discovered this band way back. The first Enslaved album that I got was Elt. So I've sort of been there for many of the changes that they've made to their sound over the years, and I've always been on board with it, but those two records just did not do it for me. Um, and it didn't help then that uh, the first single, I believe, that it's slave released off this album was Forest Dweller, the third song on this album, uh, and a song which um, is... I think in I think that my first initial impression of it was pretty much uniformly negative, and then I've gone back since and I've listened to it. And actually, aside from the very overindulgent keyboard solo that they toss in at kind of the two and a half minute mark, uh, the rest of the record or the rest of the song is actually pretty good. Um, that keyboard solo is just so terrible, though. It it kind of reminds me a bit of a a very hackneyed tribute to the crazy world of Arthur Brown, um, you know, and whilst some reviewers I've, I've heard praise it for being fun and, and interesting, you know, it might be interesting to you, it might be fun to you, but for me, it takes, it takes me out of the experience, um, especially on a song like that. But as a, as a whole, the album has actually turned out to be a lot better than I thought it was going to be. It starts off with a song called Behind the Mirror, uh, that has kind of this intro of what sounds like waves crashing against the rocks and then uh, a, a riff that really reminds me of Voivod. Like I could almost hear Snake doing his vocals uh, at the very so start of the song. Um, but uh, no sooner has the song kind of thrown you, uh, thrown you a Voivod-flavored bone then, you know, enslaved very quickly start, you know, darting from one influence to the next. And that's kind of the, the story with most of this record, you know, much like the last couple of albums. Congelia is the next track. Um, you know, again, if you go back about five or so episodes when I was talking about this song on uh, the News Rant, the first three and a half minutes or so is actually pretty monotonous. And, and, and were it not for the fact that it is entirely salvaged by maybe one of the greatest sequences in all of Enslaved's back catalogue, which is this kind of clean sung, swelling melody that, that kicks in around the halfway mark of the song. I mean, it could very easily have been just a throwaway track. Um, also, I've heard people describe the opening of that song or the opening three and a half minutes as having a lot in common with death metal. I, I completely disagree with that. It actually reminds me a little of Oranzi Pazuzu, just not as good as Oranzi Pazuzu. But either way, when, when the song actually kicks in, 
it's kind of like or when that melody i should say kicks in it's kind of like the 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 monotony and the, the the tedium of the previous three and a half minutes it's almost like it made sense it's like they're kind of keeping you lingering and then they they're feeding you they're giving you a little taste of what they can really do and that tends to be the case on a lot of moments on this record i mean there's there's parts of songs where you just think to yourself jesus guys you like just just restrain it a little bit you're being overindulgent and then almost as you get to the point where you're about to disengage or at least that that's been the case for me they'll throw you throw something at you and remind you of why they are such a revered band a uh, great example of that Heimdall the, the concluding um uh, concluding song it uh, kind of sounds a little bit like Meshuggah at the start of the uh, of the tune goes on for about two three minutes in that vein and then all of a sudden it's like you hearing a five minute summary of all of the best things that they've done throughout their entire career and it's a perfect way to end the uh, to end the record to be honest with you um all of the performances as you can uh, as you've come to expect from uh, enslaved are absolutely on target on this record um the production is beautiful the album cover is absolutely stunning as well um you know just a really um uh, a really sort of somber haunting photo of a you know norwegian fjord uh but uh yeah it's a it's a record that it, it's going to take you a couple of listens to thoroughly appreciate and thoroughly get into um but i would definitely say it is substantially better than the two records that preceded it it shows that even after 16 records enslaved still have a lot in the tank and uh you know i think that really says something i mean these these folks have been uh, all these gentlemen have been some of the most long-serving from the second wave of uh, the Norwegian black metal scene. Um, and uh, to be able to turn out music that is still this vibrant and this original and this interesting, even if they do dip into self-indulgence on occasion, uh, I think um, is a testament to their excellence and their greatness. And the fact that they'll, you know, when they do decide to hang it up, they'll be remembered as uh, some of the best to ever do it. On that note, I'm going to play you uh, the very track that I spoke about earlier so that you can see what I mean, um, you know, as, as about that monotony leading into something absolutely incredible. Uh, this is a song called Congelia.
You just listened to Congelia by Enslaved off their new record, Heimdall, uh, record number 16 in the Enslaved canon. It's available right now on Nuclear Blast Records, and I'll post the link to their Bandcamp in the description of the podcast. As always, if you uh, go and pick it up, let them know who sent you, and uh, who knows, maybe one day we'll have one of the gentlemen from Enslaved on the show as well. Uh, Right now, if you love Maxine Waters for her mind as well as her body, then it's time to get to step in, because this is my weekly news rant. Before we get started on Metal Storm, I uh, wanted to take a few minutes just to talk about this very quickly. So uh, on the Spiked Online website, Brendan O'Neill, who's an excellent writer, if uh, you're interested in politics at all, writes a fantastic article called The Sinister Cruelty of Lockdown Has Been Laid Bare. Uh, And in it, he chronicles uh, the findings from the Daily Telegraph's lockdown files. For those of you living in the States that don't know, uh, much like the Twitter files, which has been um, chronicled by Matt Taibbi and Barry Weiss, all of which is excellent and not only excellent, but also illuminating and infuriating, um, a uh, whistleblower has come forth with uh, a host of like a trove of um, WhatsApp messages exchanged by the British government during lockdown. Uh, And it reveals that um, you know, it reveals pretty much what we've been talking about on this podcast many, many times. Uh, the fact that the politicians were not doing this um, to save you or I, uh, but they were doing it for political gain and even worse, while they were doing it, they were laughing at us. So uh, a couple of things I wanted to uh, highlight in here. Um, It says here, they were laughing at us. They didn't only lock us down. They didn't only suspend virtually every one of our civil liberties, including a right none of us ever expected to lose, the right to leave our homes. They didn't only spy on us with drones and encourage us to snitch on that neighbor going for a sneaky second jog and fine teenagers life-ruining sums of money for holding house parties. They also chuckled about it. It was funny to them. In one of the most startling WhatsApp chats revealed in the Daily Telegraph's lockdown files, a senior civil servant says the following about Brits returning from trips abroad who were forced to quarantine in a stuffy hotel for 10 days. Hilarious. Uh, It then goes on to talk about a number of other insane ideas that the government were floating at the time, including um, separating children from their parents uh, if uh, there was COVID in the home. Uh, At one point, apparently, they were also floating the idea of destroying people's pets as a preemptive measure to prevent the spread of, uh, of COVID. I, as I said, I feel vindicated because I've I've spoken about this on the podcast many many times. Uh, you know, any conversation that you try to have with certain folks who are of a particular ideological bent uh, during lockdown, you would respond to this in an incredibly emotive way. Uh, you know, failed to follow or believe any of their own common sense. Uh, they only believed what the government spoon fed them. And I think what is now becoming increasingly clear, and it's not just here in the UK, it's many many of the states in the US, uh, Canada, New Zealand, South Africa, Dubai, many other countries. This was so such a poorly handled situation that had such a negative impact on people both physically and mentally. Um, it is, it, it's fucking mind-boggling. And, you know, I think what is most sinister is that whilst this is now uh, or whilst this should be a massive news story, the government have revived uh, a, uh, a five-year-old terrorism case, the Ariana Grande terrorist bombing, um, as a means to distract from their own incompetence. And the, the irony of, of you know digging up uh, you know a terrorism or terrorist bombing that's five years old. Uh, in that instance, they're also not taking responsibility for their failings in allowing that to happen. Um, th- instead, they're lamenting the fact that as people, we no longer fear terrorism like we used to. I, As I've said before, I mean, this is a clear example of a of the fact that whether you vote for liberal policies or whether you're more right-leaning, um, when it comes to politicians versus the rest of us, it is absolutely us and them. And I think that based on what's coming out in the Twitter files, what's coming out in these lockdown files, it behooves all of us to remember that we must never forgive, we must never forget, and we must never, ever allow these bottom-feeding scumbags to do this to us ever again. It's, uh, yeah, as I said, reading this, it just fucking, you know, boils my oats. Um... And what, what I find astounding is how many people fell for this shit. 
you know, like the lies around uh, or, or, the, or the lies around weapons of mass destruction, you know, the lie that got us into the Iraq war, like that never happened. Like the lies around the 2008 financial crash never happened. They just fell hook, line and sinker for another fucking trove of absolute nonsense. Like I said, these these politicians were not doing this to to help us. Uh, they were doing this for our for their own political ends. And in their eyes, we are pawns who are entirely and utterly expendable based on, you know, what's best for them and what's best for their careers. Anyway, just thought I would uh, get us started off on a uh, on a positive note. <laughs> but, um, you know, the good thing is, though, and I, I, I actually partly mentioned this, too, because uh, Carl Icara and Mike Hill um, did a really great episode on um, Everything Went Black, where they had quite a personal conversation about, you know, the impact that lockdowns had on them. Um, and that's kind of what got me thinking about this, um, you know, but I do think some of the good that came out of it is, you know, the horseman essentially, you know, was born out of lockdown. You know, we all connected and, and you know, befriended each other and, and this community developed thanks to lockdown. Um, you know, there were there were some good things that came from it. But, uh, you know, as a as something that the politicians inflicted on society, I don't think necessarily that, you know, they were taking orders directly from uh, Klaus Schwab. But uh, there's certainly it's, it's certainly a symphony of incompetence at the very, very least. And it is proof that, in my view, government should be um, no more than 2% of the population. A, gov a government should only provide the most essential of services consistent with law and order. Everything else should, uh, should be out of their hands because they don't know how to manage anything else. And if you, the, the more power, the more authority that you give a government, the greater the chance of corruption and waste. Anyways, let's, uh, let's get on to Metal Storm um, and uh, actually talk about something a bit more positive. Omnium Gathering, or Omnium Gatherum, sorry, are releasing an EP in June and have debuted their first single. It says here on June the 2nd, 2023, Omnium Gatherum will put out a new EP called Slasher. Uh, the four-piece music effort was mixed by Jens Bogren and mastered by Tony Lindgren. For a first preview of the upcoming outing, check out the video for the title track. I cannot recall when last I've actually listened to Omnium Gatherum, um, but I do think, if, if memory isn't failing me, I do think there was a time when I actually did like some of the stuff that uh, that I'd heard. So let's uh, let's give this a quick listen. quite like that um i mean firstly the um the mustache that drummer is sporting makes a bold statement <laughs> i mean you you have to be a confident man to pull that off in 2023 um the i think the best part of what i'm hearing here is the is the melody um and normally as you all know melodic death metal isn't really my bag um but i, I can't put my finger on where that melody was inspired from it's definitely not, you know, the standard, you know, Iron Maiden, Paint by Numbers nonsense that a lot of melodic death metal bands do. But uh, there's, there's something about it that sounds, that, that's interesting to me. Um, uh, the vocals, I'm, I'm there's, some, there's also something about that that I can't quite put my finger on to the opposite end. <laughs> not necessarily quite liking it, but, uh, you know, I think overall it's, it's actually a pretty enjoyable song. Um, I mean, again, I, I've, I've sort of not kept tabs on this band, so I don't know how long they've been out of action for. Um, I don't know how big of a deal it is them actually coming back, but uh, so far, so good. Let's give it another 30 seconds. I 
I like that keyboard that they have coming over the um, the riff there. I mean, it's not, it's nothing overbearing. It's nothing, you know, uh, needlessly complicated. It's kind of just enough to help elevate that riff, uh, you know, and to really sort of help with the atmosphere there. Um, let's get back to it. It's maybe getting a little a little wimpy but um uh, anyways not bad i wouldn't say it's worthy of a uh, of a top notch accolade but it's uh, it's not bad okay let's move on um next up we have got uh dawn raid presenting a go as free companion single uh dawn raid are actually going to be on that reaper fest lineup um I have, generally speaking, never been a very big fan of this band, and I am especially not a fan of uh, some of their, uh, what I believe to be, and I, I, I'm happy to be corrected on this, but what I believe to be their communist <laughs> political leanings. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm always willing to be convinced when it comes to music, and I certainly don't have to agree with everything somebody thinks to, uh, to like the music that they make. So um, just, just so that I know whether or not it's uh, going to be beer time or, uh, you know, walking around outside in the street time when they play at Reaper Fest, uh, let's hear what Go as Free Companion sounds like. All right, so there's uh, just just to, to explain the silence they've got. If you if you're listening to this rather than watching this on YouTube, um, they have a Lord of the Rings quote kicking off the music video. It says, "Go with him as free companions to help him on his way. Uh, you may tarry or come back or turn aside from other paths or into other paths as chance allows. The further you go, the less easy it will be to withdraw. Yet no oath or bond is laid uh, on you to go further than you will go now with free hearts." quote attributed to Elrond of the Fellowship of the Ring. Interestingly enough, by the way, as I just tie back very quickly to the uh, UK government and their um, uh, their ridiculous uh, notion of how to manage a country, um, some of you potentially check out the Trigonometry podcast. They had somebody on there from Big Brother Watch a while back, and she was talking about um, this part of the, I think the military brigade 77, and um, things that they were doing to, uh, or, or the ways in which they were monitoring citizens who dissented from the government, dissented from the COVID narrative. Um, one of the things that they were doing under the auspices of uh, preventing far-right radicalization um, is they were looking at people who um, were watching certain TV shows, reading certain books. Amongst the books was Lord of the Rings. So uh, I sincerely hope that um, using a Lord of the Rings quote has not landed Dawn Raid on the path to far-right radicalization, uh, which would be quite a jump given, uh, given their current political leanings. But um, anyways, let's, uh, let's hope the song actually gets started pretty soon. I'm very open-minded, but I'm gonna I'm gonna seriously question how the fuck Prosthetic Records signed this, and yet Trivax, uh, I mean Trivax are signed now, but you know they they were looking for a record label for quite a while. Quell, Stellar Master Elite, um, uh, Masters Call, you know a bunch of bands that we've played on this podcast that are fucking superb that don't have labels how those bands do not have record labels that have signed them but prosthetic records signed this i don't I, I don't get it first minute so far those drums are i mean they just don't they just sound lame 
the melody on that on that violin that sounds okay but i mean everything here just kind of sounds it sounds bush league meat here uh it's just i mean and, and again it's got nothing to do with the politics i i i don't give a shit what people think generally speaking unless you're in a you know overt neo-nazi band which i you know just won't listen to on principle um i, I don't mind what people think but uh yeah this i'm just i'm not feeling it but it's maybe maybe things change It definitely gets better once the violin is done. Um, you know, I like that mid-tempo gallop. I think the vocalist actually sounds pretty good there. And I remember him not not particularly liking him uh, when I listened to tracks from the first record that they put out. So, uh, you know, that that is an improvement. Um, that breakdown that we just started on there, that sounded like it was pretty decent. But, um, yeah, that opening is just, it's just misguided. Um, I don't, I, you know, again, I don't mind you using violins and stuff like that. I like experimentation, but it, on this song, it's just not working. So, uh, it's it, for anyone who who did listen to that and says this is said to themselves, this is mind blowing. Just uh, just a quick note here to say, "Goes Free Companions," the newest single from Dawn Raid's forthcoming studio release, "To Know the Light," has premiered online in the form of an official video directed by Simon Barr. The new music output comes out on the uh, on March the twenty fourth via Prosthetic Records. I still stick by what I said. Born Ultra should be signed to Prosthetic Records, uh, yet they go, uh, they are sans their label home, and yet these guys have one. Um, who knows, though? The rest of the record might be a little bit different, but I'm not bought into that at all. Okay, we move on. Um, Cloak have uh, announced their third studio record. It says here, Black and Heavy Metal Masters Cloak will be releasing their third full-length album, Black Flame Eternal, on May the 26th, 2023. For a preview of the new outing, the Atlanta-based Unity premiere blistering first single, Invictus, along with the scorching music video directed by, uh, sorry, co-directed by Nick Adams and Cloak frontman Scott Taysom. Scott Taysom, of course, has been a guest on the podcast. He will definitely be a guest at some point again in the uh, upcoming months. Uh, and I have liked both of Cloak's previous two records. So I know he spoke about the album on um, on the podcast when he was on here. Said it was going to be a little bit heavier and a bit darker than the stuff that they had done previously. Um, so uh, I've been excited to hear this for a while. And rather than carry on uh, jibber-jabbering, <laughs> let's, uh, let's get to it.
So this is something where you can very, very clearly hear the influences come through you know, really clearly. That, that opening riff uh, reminds me a little bit of uh, the riffs that you would have thought Samoth uh, uh, contributed to Emperor. You know, we go, and I say that because Samoth, in my view, is a very, very distinct riffing style. You heard it on Zyklon, you heard it on the Wretched End, um, and definitely, like if you, you know, having heard those bands, if you go back and listen to Emperor, you can hear what he would have contributed. So it sounds like very distinct Samoth influence in that first riff, which is great. Then this, the the you know kind of that verse is reminds me a little bit of uh, dissection actually like rain chaos era dissection only not shit <laughs> and then you've got this really cool bridge uh, which that I don't quite know what that reminds me of but um, that, I'd say that actually sounds a bit more sort of distinct to the previous cloak records um, but all of it kind of comes together and works really really well I like Scott's vocals uh, I think the drummer is doing a sensational job. Uh, and and on on the whole, that first one minute twelve seconds of the song, I think, works very very well. It says here, drummer Sean Bruno comments on the song: "No composition by the band has so perfectly captured our essence to date. The time spent in isolation allowed not only personal growth but tremendous reflection on a lifetime of inspiration." Probably coming back to what I said before. Um, the song came together aggressively once we started working on new material and it was clear that we were approaching things differently this time around. Anger and empowerment were much more evident as opposed to the more melody-driven material in the past albums. To us, Invictus is a thesis of sorts. Uh, it's everything about who we were before this band and where we are headed together moving forward. Uh, I like what I'm hearing so far, so let's get back to it. <laughs> I quite like the music video as well. It reminds me a bit of the kind of old school aesthetic that Angerot had on the on their music video. We of course listened to that Angerot single last week, um, and you know I, I just want to stress again. I think you know having those influences come out you know quite prominently uh, in the beginning of the record. That's not a or song. I should say sorry song. That's not a bad thing. Um, uh, you know when it's done well, I, it's a great thing. You know we all love those bands and we all grew up listening to those bands. And I think you know having that sort of degree of um, uh, respect and honoring those um, you know those those influences with your music, but sort of wrapping it up you know with your own personality and with your own interpretation. I think that's awesome. Uh, I've jumped to minute three so three minute 50 seconds into the song because uh, i want to hear where the track goes from we from where we left it off so um let's hear where they are at at about the halfway mark of the tune <laughs> That I fucking love. Um, I would say that's so good. I would uh, potentially label it top notch. Um, that clean singing is excellent. Um, Scott's voice sounds fantastic. So well done to him and to the band. I actually do have the whole record um, waiting for me uh, in my inbox. So uh, normally I, I, I'm not really the biggest fan of listening to promos because I'm a bit of a snob when it comes to 320k um <laughs> mp3s uh i like having flak files so i you know stream in high res put it on the old hi-fi speaking of which um i've done two hi-fi dedicated episodes on this podcast so far what i was thinking of doing actually rather than doing another one is recording a youtube only clip of me doing a walkthrough of the hi-fi rack 
uh, because I've made quite a significant number of changes. And, um, you know, for those of you that's in, who are interested, you can check it out. Um, and uh, you can also see, uh, if for those of you who are in bands that, you know, have had your music reviewed on the podcast, what I listen to it on when I'm, you know, uh, when I'm going to when I'm going to review it on the show. So I feel that it gets the best possible shake. Okay, uh, Keep of Kalesen have posted a new song in the wake of their new album release, Catharsis, which gets dropped on March the 24th via Back on Black Records. Norwegian black metal formation Keep of Kalesen have launched the first single and title track. I have... I liked the first couple of Keep of Kalesen records, and then there was an album that they put out, and I actually can't even remember the name of it, but I do remember... The more the most recent thing that I had heard by this band, I absolutely hated, and and hated it so much that I I didn't even go back to the earlier stuff ever again after that. And I'm gonna I'm just looking it up on my phone now so I can remind myself. But yeah, I'm uh, I'm curious to hear what they've done this time around. I know there's a couple of you that that really like this band. So yeah, so so just um, the the records that I liked, I thought that Through Times of War was excellent. Um, I thought that uh, Agnin, A Journey Through the Dark, is very, very cool, and I liked Armada very much as well. That came out in uh, 2006. Colossus, uh, and particularly Reptilian, uh, the two follow-up records, I did not enjoy. And Epistemology, which they put out in 2015, I didn't even know about, and that's how much I disliked <laughs> those previous records. I didn't even bother with the next stuff. So um, I can't say I'm particularly excited about hearing this, but uh, you never know. You know, there's some bands that kind of go an experimental route and then they realize the error of their ways and they come back to doing what they're good at. Uh, maybe that's what Keep of Kalesen have done this time around. We will find out right now. <laughs> fuck on so the lyrics are step through the gate and into a grand new fate before it's too late release me from hate i think you can all relate now i i insulted i said some pretty you know mean things about firstborn and uh the shit lyrics that they have and firstborn of course the new band featuring chris adler of formerly of lamb of god i said some intentionally nasty things about their lyrics on last week's episode but it turns out that they've got nothing in the shit lyrics department on keep of Galesson. that is without a doubt the, the those are the worst lyrics I've, I've maybe heard in my entire life it's like it was written by a fucking five-year-old <laughs> I don't I don't really enjoy rhyming lyrics to begin with. I think it's very pedestrian um, and very often cringeworthy, but the cringe factor there, especially that line, I think you can all relate, would mean that this song would need to be like Akrokoka levels of genius to be able to overcome that nonsense. And so far it is not. I mean, musically... It's, you know, there's a blast beat, but there's, I mean, it's kind of all show and no go. That's how it sounds to me. Um, I'm going to give it another, let's actually jump to the middle of the track. Because I can I can imagine the song is just going to sort of carry on and carry on in that same vein. But let's, let's jump to the middle of the track. Maybe the Keep of Coles and Men can do something to vindicate themselves. But uh, right now, uh, this is getting a very decided thumbs down. <laughs> I cannot be denied my fate. You shall not decide. Fucking hell, that's lame. Let me know in the comments what you guys think. Uh, but that to me is 
utter shit. I don't know how else to describe it. It's just complete and utter garbage. Um, Cradle of Filth announced first live album in 20 years. Uh, Cradle of Filth announced their first live album in 20 years. Trouble and their double lives are set to be released on April 28th, 2023 via Napalm Records. Ironically, it was seeing Cradle of Filth live that made, uh, that I think really amplified my intense dislike for them. But I know that many of you are probably dying to know what I think of the new Cradle of Filth single. And as luck would have it, they've posted the video right here. The single is called She Is A Fire. Um, and uh, what it says about this record is it was recorded between 2014 and 2019 at different performances in the USA, Europe, and Australia, and beyond there, or oh, sorry, and beyond during their Cryptorania world tour, produced, mixed, and mastered by Scott Atkins at Grindstone Studios in Suffolk, England. After that, Keep of Galesson song, you never know. <laughs> Recency bias might actually make me like this, so let's give it a quick spin. Just freeze frame on the, on the, this this woman that they've got in the music video, looking incredibly anguished. Uh, it's the same facial expression you'd expect from your wife or girlfriend if she catches you watching a uh, Phoenix Marie feature film. <laughs> For those that know what I mean. But anyways, let's get back to it. So this music is actually not bad. I think the drummer is excellent. I mean, I, I, I don't even know who their drummer is anymore. I know Nick Barker obviously used to drum for them, the, the legendary Nick Barker. Um, but musically, I don't think this is bad at all. Uh, I like the melody. I like the riff. Uh, drummer is great, as I said. That keyboard that is playing on the bit that we just paused on now, that's pretty cool. The weak link in this band is Danny Filth. Um, and it actually is starting to sound to me increasingly like he's not able to carry off the vocals like he used to anymore. I mean, he's, he's always had like the highest, highest pitch scream. Um, you know, some call it scream. Others might refer to it as whining, <laughs> black metal whining. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, it sounds like he's not only struggling to keep that up, but it just sounds, it kind of makes it sound even worse that he's still attempting to do so. So, uh, you know, it's ironic because I know for many people he's one of the main reasons they listen to the band. You know, he's he's obviously, much as I might not necessarily have a fondness for the bloke, he's he's clearly a charismatic chap and you know somebody who um, you know has managed to attract a great many people to listen to his band. But um, I think if you had a more capable vocalist in the in the vocal booth, or even if Danny decided to you know just make a few adjustments to his vocal style, I think the song would have been infinitely better. Uh, that being said, I am willing to give it another 45 seconds. So right there, if that is was literally all he did with his vocals, or he just or not even all, if he just switched for the majority of the time to that kind of vocal style, um, it would sound way better than the the you know girlish squeals that he deploys elsewhere. And 
and then right there he loses me again. Um, what I will say though, uh, as you know, as a means to balance out the rancor that has just come out of my mouth, the album cover is pretty cool. Um, again, I, I think it's been a while since Cradle of Filth, you know, have or will mean anything to me. But um, you know, that song's not bad. Uh, speaking of a band who uh, also really doesn't mean much to me any longer, Behemoth have announced their European Summer Tour. Uh, and I'm interested to look at this just because I'm curious to see who's opening for them. It says here that um, they've got a tour coming up called, I think, The Death of the Summer, alongside a bunch of festival appearances, blah, blah, blah. Looks like they are taking out Hypocrisy, that um, funky new uh, innovative band, um, and Spirit World, which I do like very much, but it's like, you know, crossover thrash. It's definitely not black metal. They've got Imperial Triumphant out with them on uh, on one date, and then they've got Garea, which is interesting because I think Garea are basically the new behemoth, uh, and Vended, Corey Taylor's son's new metal band. Um, and I think when you look at that, it does make sense to me that um, Nurgle would would speak ill of a lot of modern black metal bands um, because I think he is scared shitless of taking them out with him on tour. This guy would never take a Cleese and Panzerfaust, um, you know, out uh, with him on the road because he knows that those bands would show him up. And uh, as I've said before, I think a lot of his comments come from just a place of bitterness. He knows his best days, his prime has passed him by, which actually means taking out Garia is particularly ballsy. Because uh, I suspect that um, that's one of those those um, dynamics or one of those bills where you can very easily see the the young bucks showing up the uh, the old guard, showing up the the worn out beta male that is uh, that is Nurgle. Okay, Metallica have launched a new single. I said at the top of the show we were going to listen to this. Uh, they are O for two right now in my view. And as always, as, like as I've said before, there's always one or two good songs on every Metallica album. Um, you you need to dig around for it, but there was a decent song on the last Metallica record. Uh, Halos on Fire, I think, was the song. Then like, Death Magnetic. I don't actually know if there was a good song on that. It was mostly just shit. And then um, the previous record to that, what was that? Saint Anger. I mean, that was it was all crap. But on Load and Reload, a couple of not bad tracks. So... Uh, I expect that there's at least one song worth listening to on 72 Seasons is my point. And the first two singles, Lux Eterna and Screaming Suicide, has, has been very, very far from listenable. It says here, Metallica have just shared a video clip for the new re newly released single, If Darkness Had a Sun. The latter is from the upcoming album 72 Seasons, which arrives on April the 14th, 2023. Um, nothing much more to say other than Let's hear if this is the bleeding me of 72 sons. Do you know what the first words are that come to mind when I hear, or, or, or following the uh, one minute, 11 seconds we've just heard? Do you see what I see? Truth is an offense. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's interesting because Lars Ulrich has spoken before about the fact that he doesn't like the song Eye of the Beholder and they don't really ever play it live. But that sounds, I mean, if they went straight into the, uh, the opening verse to Eye of the Beholder, I don't think it would come as a surprise to anybody. Uh, now, that being said, 
if I were pressed, I would probably put Eye of the Beholder in my top 20, maybe even my top 15 Metallica songs. So I, I am not hating what I'm hearing. I actually think that sounds pretty good, and it certainly sounds better than the previous two singles. Um, big question, though, is uh, what they do with the verse and the chorus. And uh, let's hope, because they are certainly taking their goddamn sweet time with this intro. Let's hope we get to that soon. that chorus could have been a little punchier um you know i think the hook could have been a bit more prominent but i have to tell you i think that's the best i've heard metallica sound maybe in fuck 10 years 15 years i'd say best i've heard metallica sound since bleeding me that is that's a pretty cool song that um it doesn't sound like a bunch of tired old men um you know trying to be heavy but failing Yes, it sounds almost exactly like, or certainly at the beginning sounds exactly like Eye of the Beholder, um, but uh, I don't mind it at all. I actually think that's pretty good. Um, so Metallica, officially two and one. By the way, I'm recording this on Saturday the 4th of March. I don't know who of you are going to be watching the uh, John jones Garnet fight on UFC 285, but I am very, very, very excited about that. Uh, I, more excited than I have been for an MMA fight for the better part of um, fuck, two years, three years. Uh, and my favorite fighter, Valentina Shevchenko, is going to be on it as well. So uh, curious to see what happens in that fight. Um, Enforced drop new single and video is the next headline. Uh, I really, really like that Enforced record that uh, came out. I think it was about two years ago. We reviewed it on the show, and it was a massive surprise. Um, it says here, on April the 28th, Enforced will release their third full-length, War Remains. For a preview of this record, the video, directed and edited by Ethan um, Genserowski, for the new single, Hanged by My Hand, is now available for streaming down under. Let's give it a quick listen. Just, just to point out, the song is instantly better because of that voice noise he just made there. Very few things can make a song sound cooler than somebody that knows when to do a well-timed, ooh, ow, it's genius, fucking genius. And I like what I've heard so far too. Uh, I just reminded myself now that previous record was called um, Kill Grid. It came out in 2021. It had the last song on that record is a song called Trespasser, has some of the fucking best gang vocals I've heard since like the old school of, you know, the, the, the prime years of New York hardcore, the prime years of Biohazard. Um, so if you haven't listened to it, go, make sure you go check it out. But anyways, uh, let's get back to this one.
I like this very much. I mean, there's nothing uh, particularly original about it, but, you know, this is all about a vibe. Uh, and the vibe is broken bones. <laughs> so I think this is fucking cool. Um, it says here, vocalist Knox Colby states, the song is about living in a world governed by the ignorant, the incompetent, and the ineffective, shrugging off or poorly trying to mask how inept they truly are. The Norfolk Southern train derailment in Ohio is a perfect example. Side note there, uh, shout out to anybody um, who has been affected by that. I actually know somebody who lives in Ohio. Um, she and her family were told they needed to evacuate. So it is a complete shit show. Um, what I, From my understanding, it might potentially be one of the biggest ecological disasters in North American history. Uh, and it took um, Crown Prince of Morons, um, Pete Buttigieg, 10 days and a visit from Trump to actually show his face there. Uh, and clearly, had Trump not visited there, he never would have turned up. And the reason for that is he doesn't give a shit. Exactly what I said earlier. Um, we are pawns and we are disposable in their eyes. And the one thing that I would say uh, I maybe disagree with Knox on here is they are not trying to mask how inept they are. And I don't even think this is incompetence. They just don't give a shit. They are very competent at being thieves. Uh, and they're very competent at leeching off the taxpayer. Um, anyway, it's, he carries on to say, the song seethes with no way forward as the world around you burns in acid fire. You'd rather die with your dignity than having some bastard suit uh, step over you like a piece of garbage, only remembering you as collateral damage and not as the human being you once were. They don't care about you. Look out for yourself behind a poison smile, decline in denial. Pretty cool. Um, you know, one thing that I would say, I, I, think, I think more and more people are starting to wake up to this us and them um battle that we're all in it's interesting to see the the road that folks like bill maher and jimmy Dore have traveled and you know the only place where i still vehemently disagree with them is that you know whether it's bill maher whether it's russell brand they do for some reason still come back to this idea that you should give or that the, that the solution is to give government more control more power um, you know, they support policies that would effectively enlarge government rather than decrease the size of it. And I'm not a libertarian, but uh, I don't really get the logic behind acknowledging that government is, is you know, incompetent in the main and wasteful uh, and corrupt and then supporting ideals and policies that give them more power. That doesn't make any sense to me, which is why I said I, my personal view is government's responsibility is maintaining law and order, just about nothing else. Uh, they should get out of medicine. They should get out of um, more or less anything that is not, you know, a baseline of what they're there to deliver. And equally, I, I think we, we and I spoke to Sam about this, Sam Bean about this last week. I think we have to get to a place where we can publicly audit government finance because it's our fucking money. If somebody, if, if the government increases taxes, I should reasonably be able to say, what am I getting in exchange for it? It, I, you know, and, and you can take all the fair share fucking bullshit out of the equation. You know, fair share based on what? Am I, am I breathing more oxygen than another person? Absolutely not. I, I pay more taxes regardless, um, you know, because I spend more money than, you know, people that are, are, are less well off. But just because somebody has, has decided to stay at home and not work doesn't mean that I should pay more because they're less well off than I am. That's fucking ridiculous. So they can take the fair share nonsense and they can shove it. Um, as I said, government should be by the people for the people. And again, if if anyone still has the idea that um, you know that 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 is the case, that that's the kind of ideal that our government is based on, after everything that's happened over the last two or three years, and I don't know what to tell you, because I don't think there's anything. I don't think the government could feasibly do anything that will bring you to uh, any sort of greater insight about what their what their role here actually is, and the role being feeding at the trough. And then holding their hand out for more money. I mean, it's 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 almost like they follow a, a kind of a religious blueprint. Okay, uh, Celestial Sanctuary post a new track. It says here, UK-based uh, death metal ensemble Celestial Sanctuary premiere a new single, Perpetual Annihilation, taken from their upcoming music output, Soul Diminished, uh, which will be out in stores on March the 27th via Church Road Records. And I say that because March the 27th is my 43rd birthday. So clearly, the men from Celestial Sanctuary have timed Perpetual Annihilation's release as some sort of living tribute. Uh, question now is whether or not I will accept their living tribute. So uh, let's give it a quick listen.
pretty cool, I think. Um, Celestial Sanctuary, your tribute is acknowledged and enjoyed. <laughs> so, but yeah, that song's pretty decent. Um, it seems like it's becoming all the rage, these uh, music videos that are made to look like they were shot on, you know, a, a handheld with analog tape. Um, you know, like they, they, like it's, it looks like it's redubbed 500 times, you know, the cool stuff you used to get from your mates. Um, and I, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not mad at it, to be honest with you. And as far as the song is concerned, uh, you know, it's pretty standard death metal, but pretty decent as well. I can see how this would go down well in a, uh, you know, at any show. Um, very competently played. I like the effect on the vocals. Um, as I said, nothing that is particularly outstanding, but uh, you know, uh, it's it's competently well played death metal. And if you're a death metal fan right now, I mean, you must surely be spoiled for choice with how much good stuff is coming out. Uh, you know, and also the fact that I think the death metal genre is, you know, kind of finally, or in the last couple of years, has finally woken up and is really kind of the genre. I think is really pushing itself forward, and there's really really good stuff coming out. Um, okay, let's see if there's anything else here to talk about um, before we head over to the Democrats' Guide to Rock Music. Um, I am going to waver a bit and say there is not much going on here. Um, benediction bassist steps down, uh, replacement introduced. The UK's benediction revealed that bassist Dan Bate has decided to step down due to family commitments. At the same time, death metal veterans introduced Nick Sampson as the full-time replacement. Those dudes are very long in the tooth. They've got a couple of cool tunes, though. Um, there's an album called Grind Bastard, which is very good. And actually, was it the second or the last record that they did um, that had... Um, Dave from uh, what's his face and El Nathrak on vocals uh, really 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 good like surprisingly good um, if you haven't listened to it yet I would definitely suggest that you do okay let's move on to Blabbermouth um, Alice Cooper on his upcoming album is really going to knock you out I didn't realize that he was still making music I mean Jesus how old must that poor guy be um, yeah I'll have to look that up in a second but uh Se oh, yeah, yeah, it says, 75 years old. At the time, the now 75-year-old singer uh, expressed hope that the first of his new LPs would arrive later this year. So multiple new albums coming out. Uh, it's kind of like the old days when you're touring and putting out records at the same time, Alice explained. It kind of takes me back to when you're doing Love It to Death, and then you tour for Love It to Death. While you're doing Love It to Death, um, you're writing Killer. When, you love it, when Love It to Death is over, Killer comes out, and then you go uh, support that. And while you're doing Killer, you're writing Schools Out. Fucking hell, he's a busy dude. Uh, and I'll tell you what, my parents are um, are not 75 yet. I can't see them putting out multiple records and going on tour. Uh, I did get to see them, though. I get, did get to surprise them when I was in Dubai. I mentioned, I think, to a couple of you, and I posted about it on Instagram that I was going to go to Dubai for work. Uh, a pretty fucking hectic week, actually, um, which if I sound a bit dopey, that's probably why. I did, um, uh, I woke up at the fucking crack of dawn on Monday, went to Heathrow Airport, Got on a plane, got to Dubai at 8, uh, 8 p.m., tried to get some sleep up at uh, 6, 6 a.m. to the uh, the office of the client that uh, we're rolling out in, uh, in Dubai, did presentations from 8 till 6, took the client out for dinner, that was pretty cool, um, you know, repeat, you know, meetings, etc. until lunchtime on, uh, on Wednesday, then I went to go see my parents and then to the airport and back here. So uh, a whistle-stop visit, but I will definitely say I am very, very impressed with Dubai. What I saw, you know, there's no fucking trash lying all over the place. I didn't see cigarette butts everywhere. There's no graffiti. Everything is clean. Everything is orderly. Everything is, you know, everything looks great. Um, I had some really, really good meals there as well. The, the dinner that we had was fantastic. And then I, uh, the dinner that I had at the hotel was just a Philly cheesesteak, but absolutely sensational. So I will be back to Dubai for sure um like i said very impressed by what i saw uh, anyways uh it says here dave ellison metallica broke all the doors down to every obstacle in the way of heavy metal um yeah i would agree with that uh death to all featuring steve hoglan and steve sorry steve hoglan <laughs> gene hoglan and steve DiGiorgio. fan filmed video of north american tour kickoff uh max cavalera names his top three thrash albums of all time that should be pretty interesting um, as part of Jonathan Montenegro's My Three Questions 2 series, uh, former Sepultura and current Soulfly frontman Max Cavalera was asked to name his top three thrash metal albums of all time. 
Uh, he responded as follows. I went a little bit old school. The first one is from Canada. Sacrifice forward to termination. Amazing record. I played it so much when I was a teenager in Brazil. Also, nuclear assault. Uh, survive. Danny Lulka, the man. Yes, Danny on the base. Nuclear assault are amazing. Uh, they played with us in Brazil, blah, blah, blah. And the last one is Dark Angel with Darkness Descends. My favorite three thrash albums of all time. I, I don't really know what I would put in that list. I would, I would definitely have to have uh, Slayer in there. Most likely um, Show No Mercy. Possibly, maybe Show No Mercy or, or the, the, that Haunting the Chapel EP. Um, although I guess you can't really call that an album. So let's let's say Show No Mercy. Uh, and then I would put in most likely Master of Puppets, um, and then maybe something by Forbidden or by Exodus. I don't know. I have to have a think about it. I actually think when we do another one of our 666 countdowns, I think we're definitely going to have to have us a classic Thrash countdown as well. Um, Anthrax and Pantera dr drummer Charlie Benante says, Ear go, hearing aid, save his life. Um, in the video below, Anthrax and Pantera drummer Charlie Benante shares his story uh, and the and how the over-the-counter hearing aid Ergo has helped him hear life to the fullest again. Uh, when I was diagnosed with hearing loss, they were explaining to me, here's your options, and when I saw them, my stomach turned. Uh, I'm like, I can't wear this. Without my ears, I don't know how I can do my job. When I first got the Ergos and I put them in my ears, I'm like, wow, this is great. And I was like, can you see it? Can you see anything? And they were like, no. I think that there are so many musicians out there and people who work with loud noises every day uh, that are in the same boat as me but do not want to accept it. My girlfriend and my daughter definitely saw a change. I think it was just I think it, I was just dealing with something that I didn't know how to fix until the ear goes came into my life. Uh, and then I heard things again and I had clarity. They really saved the day. Although Ergo's devices are a little more expensive than other over-the-counter hearing aids, ranging from $1,450 to $2,950 a pair, their compact size and functionality rank them among the best hearing aids on the market. Uh, my mom has pretty severe hearing uh, loss, which is ironic given my dad's blindness. <laughs> but, uh, so I might have to look into that for her. Um, I, my, my hearing is also not what it used to be, but I mean, that comes from listening to loud music. And, you know, I went to about probably five, 600 shows over the course of uh, about 15 years to, um, you know, and, and most of those I never had any hearing aids and that shit catches up to you eventually. And I get where Charlie's coming from. You know, I think he's just turned 60, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, I, I'm, it's, I think that's one thing that I, as a man, I fear that descent into no longer being the alpha dog, no longer being the badass. Uh, and I think a lot of guys that are, you know, of a certain mindset, I think they, I think they struggle with that. It's like women struggling with losing their looks, um, which also means that uh, when I start to feel like things are going downhill for me, it'll be uh, testosterone replacement therapy, literally verging on the illegal. <laughs> so, uh, okay, um, let's see if there's anything else before we wrap things up. Uh, a revised third edition of To Live Is To Die, The Life and Death of Metallica's Cliff Burton is due in April. That book was written by Joel McIver, great guy. A dude who if you uh, get him, if you pin him down with some drinks, uh, he is a super fun dude to be around. And he's, uh, you know, he's got some fucking great stories based on all the books that he's written. Um, and actually, as I was talking about Metallica earlier and favorite Metallica songs, uh, I do want to say that my favorite Metallica song, without a shadow of a doubt, seek and destroy and if you have a different opinion then you are wrong to hold that opinion <laughs> guns and roses officially confirmed for this year's glastonbury festival uh now as i predicted when the rumors are about this sort of swirling around the naysayers are already out in, for, in force over here uh the uk times posted an article um and the headline was something along the lines of for the glastonbury headliners it's a man's world this year <laughs> So they are incensed about the fact that the three main headliners at Glastonbury this year, I think, are Guns N' Roses, the Arctic Monkeys, and um, Elton John. So, uh, you know, I think that's probably just the uh, just the beginning. Pretty soon, Guns N' Roses will be, you know, the worst band ever, misogynists, you know, racists. They'll listen to One in a Million and, you know, dredge that up again. And they'll say, you're not allowed to be part of our festival. I personally think that uh, Glastonbury is a uh, collection of unwashed, 
uneducated morons, uh, and I would not go even if you paid me. Um, all right, I'm going to finish up with this one, and then we wrap it up for this week. Former Venom drummer Anthony Abaddon Bray says he's doing all right in his battle with lymphoma. Former Venom and Venom Inc. drummer Abaddon, real name Anthony Bray, says he's doing all right in his battle with lymphoma. The 62-year-old musician who revived his Abaddon project in 2018 discussed his health in a new video in which he answers fan-submitted questions. Regarding where he stands in his fight against the blood cancer, Bray said, The treatments and whatever I've gone through have all been pretty well successful so far. I've got a final scan, well, I hope it's a final scan, coming up soon, and we'll find out uh, if we have to take it any further or if that's it. The type of cancer it is, it's likely to come back because it's blood-related, but I know uh, what I'm facing now, so bollocks to it, basically. Very glad to hear that. I had a very good friend um, who very nearly died of uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, back in probably 2000 and this like 2010 I think uh, you know what it did to him you know when he was at his worst you know really was absolutely terrifying uh, fortunately he's pulled through it and he's you know he's living a very you know happy and successful life now um, but I think at one point the doctors gave him about 12 percent chance of um, of survival you know and it's things like that you know and sometimes I mention this because sometimes maybe on the podcast it doesn't come across that way, but it's things like that where I, you know, really remind myself that life is short and life is finite and you need to appreciate and enjoy what you have while you have it because you never know when it's going to uh, be, when, it, when it's going to be gone. Uh, and on that note, my friends, I'm going to wrap up the news rant for this week. If you've made it all the way to the end, thank you so much. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the show. A big thanks and a shout out to uh, my guest, Thomas Erickson of Mork. Make sure that you check out that new Mork record when it drops on March the 24th. Uh, also, make sure that you back here next week because I'll be catching up with Kevin Sharp of A Venomous Concept about their new album. Like I mentioned last week uh, when we spoke... He was uh, three sheets to the wind, so it took a little while for the conversation to reach a uh, a rhythm that uh, that worked. But um, when it did, it was a lot of fun. So make sure you're back there, uh, back here for uh, for that episode next week. And uh, in the meantime, my friends, I'm going to play us out with another Norwegian classic. Uh, this being the song "Destroyer" by Gorgoroth. Way back in the day, when I used to do a radio show called The Inferno on a shitty little radio station in South Africa called RSFM. This was the song that I finished off every episode with. Um, so uh, thought that it would be worth sharing that all with you now too. Uh, if you don't know the song, uh, shame on you. But uh, even if you don't know the song, I hope whatever it is that you do, wherever it is that you are, you're staying safe, you're staying healthy, and I'll see all of you bad motherfuckers again next week.